everyone for uh, joining the Tracy microconference. Oh, now my connection is. Can you guys hear me? Because I just got a report that my connection is bad. I'm hard wired in. It was bad just me? for a while. Now it's okay. Okay, because it says my connection status is poor. So, which is weird because I'm hard wired in and I have well, a hundred megabyte. 100 megabits upload. So anyway, let me start again. Uh, thank you for joining the Tracy microconference. Uh, and we have a lot to talk about today. First thing I'll do is go through the slides. And first things first, we would like to thank the sponsors. Without sponsors, we would not be here. We would not be able to put on what I would think is the best technical conference that exists. I believe we all get a lot out of Linux plumbers and we cherish Linux plumbers. And I really want to thank our sponsors who have made this feasible. Our diamond sponsor is Facebook. Thank you very much, Facebook. Um, platinum sponsor goes to IBM. Our gold sponsors are ARM and Microsoft. And as been mentioned, you know, someone said 10 years ago, would you ever imagine that ARM and Microsoft would be our gold sponsors? Silver sponsors. And by the way, Plumbers has been going on for more than 10 years. So it is Amazon, AWS, Netflix, and Red Hat. Speaker gifts were uh, sponsored by Collabora. And for those that fill out the survey, the first 200 will get a t-shirt sponsored by VMware. And another special thanks goes to the Linux Foundation. They've helped us out a lot. A lot of people don't realize how much work the Linux Foundation does to help support plumbers, uh, they do a lot of the logistics, uh, especially when we're live. And I don't think people understand the amount that of support we get from the Linux Foundation. So we definitely want to give them a big thanks and applause. Here's the treat everyone with respect uh, slide. I'm hoping everyone did read this. We are going to be serious about this. We want good, strong technical discussions but that means you don't need to get personal. We all know how to treat people professionally. No name call calling, obviously. And so you can disagree, perfectly fine. The idea of this is to have good, healthy discussions. Constructive criticism is always wanted. You should not be upset if someone says you're wrong and has evidence why you are wrong. They you can't just say you're wrong without telling them exactly why. So be considerate and let's make sure that everything is very productive. Housekeeping rules. Uh, the, what we found to be very, very efficient for having a virtual conference is everyone keep their microphone muted and their camera off. If you want to ask a question, and I, we encourage people to ask questions at any time, even during the presentation, especially for microconferences. Microconferences are specifically made for discussion. The presentations are to help in the discussion. You're not just having a presentation and then that's it, and just a Q&A. This is not a normal like talk that you would see at a conference, other conferences, or even like the referee track. Microconference topics are basically a, like virtual meetings right here, or on live, it's real meetings. So if someone's giving a presentation, you don't understand something, feel free to interrupt them, bring up, and to do though, to do so, by raising your hand, you would turn on your camera. That's basically equivalent to raising your hand and then ask your question to unmute. And then when you're not talking or if you don't have anything to say, just turn your camera off. I've seen other conferences use the same format because so it must work. And the planning committee, uh, Dave Woodhouse was chair this year. We have Elena Zanoni, Kate Stewart, James Bottomley, Christian Br uh, Browner, Jonathan Corbett, Guy Lunardi, uh, Lunardi, and myself. Um, this takes a lot of work to put the, pull this off, and everyone worked really, really hard. So thanks, everyone. And with that, I'm going to switch to the first slide and hand presenter over to Chris, if I can find him. Alphabetical order, I should. There, Chris, you should be presenter now. Oh, one more thing before we start, I just wanted to say a couple of things is if you look down at the bottom left corner, you'll see a little download icon on the presentations. If you click on that, you can actually download the actual slides that are being discussed. 
uh, all of the presentations will have that. And for those that want to help out with the notes, if you click on shared notes, you can do that, but you can't see the chat when you do that. What I do is I bring up another window and I put into the shared notes the link to the chat that you could actually participate in the chat if you have it in another window. So with that, Chris, um, it's yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What well, or afternoon? Um, so I'm going to be talking about DTrace, um, the newest version of DTrace based on BPF and other tracing facilities in the kernel, and specifically the challenges uh, we've run into that uh, in our team, and they've been plentiful, um, mostly on our end, but also on just you know uh, funding limitations. Oh, there we go. So very short, DTrace um, based on BPF uh, is simply we have scripts for tracing. They're written in uh, D, which is kind of the name of the language used for this. It's a high level language for uh, tracing scripts. They're compiled into BPF functions. Um, we also have dynamic generation of trampoline BPF programs that then will be attached to probes. And they call those different functions depending on um, which clauses uh, need to be executed for the probe. Uh, we make also use of um, pre-compiled function library, that is C code that has been compiled into BPF, and that gets linked into these standalone BPF programs for tracing. Um, D supports local, global, and TLS variables, uh, arrays, aggregations, dynamic variables, string functions, uh, whatnot. It's obviously, it supports a bunch of complex um, functions that really you know puts BPF through its paces. So bleeding edges functionality is cool. I mean, I think we can all agree on that. And so much is being done on BPF that you know literally, you know, you can skip a week and go check what's happening with new patches and you got, you get amazed by you know what further progress has been made. And that solves many problems. Many times we've run into a problem and go look at you know, BPF next, or look on the mailing list of patches that have been posted, and uh, patches have already been out there for a while for things you run into. But the problem is production systems don't run bleeding edge kernels. So, in real life use cases that we generally run into, uh, they're going to be in production systems. So, the underlying problem ultimately is you know, you can't tell a customer they need to upgrade their system before you can help them, or to wait until a new feature is developed or uh, matures in BPF before we can do certain tracing uh, facility. And, you know, you can come up with an endless list of reasons why we cannot run with bleeding edge. Um, and again, it boils down to there is reality. And in the tracing world, that is what we have to deal with. You know, we don't really get to see the, the perfect scenarios. So that's kind of the, the backdrop of everything that we're working on. So to, to take a problem to kind of illustrate what we've been um, dealing with is because we have code that is compiled either by GCC for the pre-compiled library or dynamically using DTrace, um, we have a limited amount of registers, so we spill registers to the stack. And we found out that when you would um, spill a register that holds a constant value to the stack, you load it back, it still has all its information attached to it, uh, that it has a certain constant value and your program, you know, will verify correctly. Now it turned out that if we were storing a bounded value, you know, where we know that the value in the register is within a certain range, a minimum and maximum value, and you spill that to the stack and load it back, all of a sudden the bounding information is gone. And uh, that was a, a tough problem to uh, track down for a while and once we figure this out, it's like, okay, this can be, you know, this can be something nobody else has run into. And well, we were surprised actually that um, the fix that I've seen for this in uh, the kernel tree uh, appeared in one of the release candidates for uh, 5.14, and it's from July 2021. Well, we've been dealing with this problem since January, and we don't have kernels that are you know, on production systems that are, have been updated you know, since July, um, or actually since September, I think when originally this was pulled in, or beginning of August, I'm sorry. Um, so that's a problem that we ran into, that we couldn't fix by, you know, upgrading the kernel and getting a BPF version that has that patch. So 
the solution that we came up with for this was simply that well restore the balance value to the stack um uh, chris question yeah. what about pushing that fix to be backported into a stable release which would usually then get finally put into a uh, production kernel um yes and that's actually in uh, in this case that was um a solution that was fairly easy to to go with um and that's maybe what's a better illustration um kind of doing the good case bad case in a minute um so that was one of the cases where i can do in other cases uh is being more complicated to do backports because it's has you know fixes have ties into other uh components so yes in this case definitely backports was an option um in the short term, we had to come up with a, a workaround until, you know, a backported patch could go through um, sufficient testing and get through a release. So, um, but yeah, definitely backports is the first thing we always would look at. Um, so as a workaround, we basically started inserting explicit bounds checking whenever we would load the value back. And since we are generating the code dynamically anyway, we know basically what bound checks should be put in place. The only reason we need them there is so the verifier will uh, allow the uh, code to validate. Um, so you do that using conditional jump. The verifier um, looks at those values, the value ranges and updates value ranges um, on the registers. So that solved the problem in the long, in the short term until we would have a backport. But that got us into another issue. And that's with branch prediction. You know, when you're doing a comparison between two registers, and one of them has a bounded value and one of them has a constant value. Um, prediction is attempted is trying to figure out, you know, do we know based on these ranges, um, which branch is gonna be taken and how should we handle that? And then the bound get updated based on that information. Now we found that if the constant value is in the destination register and the bounded value is in the source register, that case was not handled and is not handled. So no prediction is attempted and worse, the bounds are being updated incorrectly. So there's no patch that I've been able to find uh, up until this point yet. And I'm actually gonna be submitting a patch for that this week, uh, but it, it's causing us a lot of headaches, especially with uh, code that has been uh, generated through the cross compiler from C code, because I don't have control over which register is being placed first in the conditional. So, to illustrate the problem, uh, this is just, you know, uh, an instruction of um, a conditional where we're comparing, you know, register one to register five. And if you can see register one, we know has the value 24. Register five is a range from 17 to 20. So we already know that, you know, register one's value is greater than register five, uh, no matter what, because it's outside of the range. But after the conditional, we found that the bounds for register five, the one that we're comparing with, have been updated. They have minimal value of 25 and maximum value of 20. Now that's gonna cause a lot of issues for the rest of your code uh, because it's absolutely possible. So we found through some digging, um, and it took a while to actually figure out that this was had to do with branching and not some other issue somewhere. Um, we found that in the check conditional for uh, jumps, that the, there is a case being uh, looked at that if you have a scalar value um, in the source register, and the source register is a constant, then we call, you know, is branch taken to uh, try to do branch prediction. And then based on that prediction, uh, bounds are updated. Now this blue part was not there, and that is actually the patch I'm going to be submitting, and it's such, uh, a trivial patch if you think about it, but it, you know, like with everything else, it took forever to find. We need to do the same for the destination register. And in that case, you know, we need to do uh, branch prediction based on the opposite of the conditional. That's why we do this flip opcode. And in that case, you know, we're simply comparing, you know, source register and destination register. We flip them, flip the conditional, and that will give us the correct information. And then, um, first of all, we gain uh, correct prediction on the branches when those values are known, and it also makes sure that the bounds are being updated correctly. So that was a really fun one to try to find, and fortunately, you know, we came up with a patch for it. So like I said, I will be submitting that this week. Um, 
so nobody else is going to get bit by this and it, it might actually turn out to be a solution for <laughs> problems people have been running into and maybe have never um, you know really found what problem was there so other issues that we have been running into is resource limits um, you know, tracing scripts can get pretty complex you do string manipulation um, memory management um, you need more memory than the stack provides i mean that's that's a given and so the typical solution for that would be to use a bpf map with a singleton element have a large value size and basically that value is used as addressable memory uh, the problem is whatever you store to that memory um, is const when you read it back it's just a plain value you can't store map pointers there or any other pointers. Um, of course, if it's kernel pointer ready, then the reference, if you're running unprivileged, uh, sorry, if you're running privileged, you can do that anyway, you can probe read, but um, I might want to store, for instance, a um, pointer to a value in a different map, and that's not possible. Plus the size of um, a map value is limited to the size of a k malloc, which um, is low. For, for, for our uses. So this is a problem we haven't really solved yet. I mean, I have some options. I just, and that's what I wanna definitely bring up for discussion. I'm not sure which one is the best one. Um, so one way would be to update the BPF support in the kernel to allow maps with a larger value size. The downside of that is that um, right now that limit is there because otherwise you cannot um, get the values for the map from user space because it uses a K-Malloc buffer um, to copy uh, the data into. Now that's not a problem that probably can, it probably can be avoided, it can be worked around, but that would be you know, more work on the implementation side of BPF to allow maps with larger values. Um, a second option, which is one that I've mostly been spending some time on, was to use multiple map values and essentially just look at your map as a collection of pages, so to speak where every value is one page um, and you use that page memory. The problem with that is that you can no longer have just a base pointer plus an offset or even just a regular pointer within you know, a value somewhere um, because if you need to run through that or if you need to, uh, you need to figure out which value something a pointer basically points into if you need to do some pointer arithmetic, anything like that. So, you're gonna have to do some form of address translation based on the pointer and its offset, see what value that falls into, like some do page memory uh, in BPF code. So that would not be that easy either. And you know, every single pro program you basically make use of this is gonna have you know, instructions for that to do that translation. And then third option would be adding a new kind of memory resource to BPF, you know, not maps, but something that doesn't have to be visible from user space, simply, a large bounded sized memory block that you can access based on a pointer and offset and maybe then even have um bpf helper support you know add helpers for kind of a malloc and a free obviously lock free versions um, things that are safe to be used um during tracing but there are possibilities there so that's what i mainly want to bring up for discussion is if anybody has any thoughts on you know how can we deal with this? How can we uh, have a solution where we can have arbitrary memory that we can use in our BPF programs that is larger than the the K-malloc size? So, do we have any BPF folks here? Hopefully. They might be all on the, BP the BPF networking track right now. Probably. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the only sad part is that we could have <laughs> about this. Yeah, it it, it is definitely it, it's an issue that um, as we have more tracing programs, it's going to get more complicated because you know there is more data we need to store. There is more um, there is more need to be able to do things, especially if you do string manipulation. You may have to copy strings to be able to work with them, and with tracing, since everything has to be allocated uh, statically, you need to basically have a fair amount of uh, memory resource behind you. Um, other issues that we've run into that I just want to highlight real quick is um, complex scripts and functions you know, need loops at some points. And there is 
reasonable loop support in BPF, especially in the most recent developments. But there is still work to be done if we want to be able to support more complex loops. Um, for instance, the detection of the invariant states so that the verifier can determine that, okay, I've seen this code before or this section of the code, and I know this has been verified to be valid. So as long as some um, parameters within certain ranges um, can be determined, we don't have to re-verify this because otherwise we get um, <clears throat> quadratic and potentially even exponential uh, complexity in the verifier and you hit that 1 million instruction limit very quickly. Um, another thing that has caused us tremendous amounts of headaches in terms of loops is that whenever you write some like slightly higher level code, you're going to have invariant relations between values in registers but the verifier doesn't know what that relationship is between those values. So it uses every value in a register as standing on its own. So if you have a loop, uh, let's say going through a string of 256 characters, and I have in one register the remaining length of what, what I am versus you know my index within the string, the verifier doesn't know that those two are related unless I recompute that every single time within my loop and then I get other issues with the invariant state possibly. So um, again, a lot of more work can be done there. And the problem is that it's, you know, that's an endless, an endless job to try to, uh, you know, be able to get safety uh, in checking on loops and you're never gonna be able to solve it anyway. Um, another issue I was is- I just wanna well, say about the, you know, the mm -hmm. whole loop issue, um, you know, you get the halting problem in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, Indeed. It's like, yeah, it's basically whack-a-mole. You could, you, <laughs> that's going to be something I made mean, right now. I'm surprised they allow what they allow for now. So, I mean, when D-Trace was in Sun OS, it's like that. What, did it have a verifier to make sure you couldn't do uh, infinite loops or did it just let anyone, you know, lock up the system if they put in a wrong program? Um, D-Trace doesn't allow loops. So okay. it didn't have that issue. And so the only place where the loops show up is in the implementation of certain uh, underlying functions. But since those underlying functions are no longer provided by us using the kernel module, but are being implemented in BPF, we can't avoid loops anymore. So we don't expose the ability to have loops to the user, but we need them internally. So would that be another solution though, to have a BPF helper that can implement a, a you know, um, What's a, what's the word? A bounded loop, that the actual is just actual code. You just call a function, say I need this to this called so many times, and it will only iterate instead of having a BPF program do it, but have actual code, a helper function within BPF to say do this multiple times. Uh, that definitely would be a solution, uh, especially for you know what we are trying to do. I don't know how, as a generic solution, that would be acceptable, but I think uh, that definitely would be a help. Um, so another thing we have run into is that there are some program types in BPF where the BPF contacts, contacts under the covers contains the register set state, but it's not accessible. You know, it, it's, you're banned from seeing it. I believe that uh, system calls is one of those. And I think actually trace points probably as well. Um, I have no idea why, given the fact that for instance, for uh, a K probe, you do have access to the register set. And so I would hope that for privileged use of BPF, that there wouldn't be an objection to have those accessible. So that is something I think that, again, needs to be brought up with the BPF people, but um, for tracing, that's kind of important. Okay, so this one, I actually have a little more uh, knowledge behind about. So you want mm -hmm. PT access to PT regs and other aspects of uh, so you need the PT regs for when the trace point was it was triggered, correct? Yeah. The problem with that, I guess, right now is to get PT regs in just some arbitrary point of code. The reason why you have it with K probes is because K probes triggers an interrupt or a breakpoint, which puts in register saves all the registers yeah. at that point. So you really the only way to do that is to trigger an interrupt. So you probably have to have some sort of infrastructure because right now the way trace points are enabled is through uh, jump jump labels or static okay. branches and it's just a jump to a function so if you want a trace or if you want the registers how do you get registers from running code 
I, yeah. I will say you'd probably have to trigger yeah. some sort of interrupt or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, hello? Well, I, could, I can hear you, Masami. Yeah. I can hear you. Okay, yeah. You, um, could, you could probably marshal them into function arguments. As, yes. as if it was a function call. And not the function call out when it's not in use as usual with this sort of thing. So uh, you'd mean you have a function or something that just says save all the registers here, but just calling that function will mess with the yeah. registers. Yeah, even though, uh, yeah, actually, that are uh, we can uh, save the registers, um, uh, PT regs, uh, but are uh, you know are the PT regs um, the contents is uh, depend on our, where uh, did you uh, save it. So that our uh, trace point is currently uh, using that uh, jump label and uh, in our uh, function, uh, let's say body. So that our, uh, we cannot, uh, when, uh, for example, after uh, calling that our, the uh, hook function, uh, if you save that uh, the registers, uh, that is uh, the, uh, the registers in the uh, called function, you know, uh, the, for example, trace, a trace point uh, callback function, um, let's say contents. So that are, it's not the, uh, the PTX in that uh, content, uh, let's say the, the context, like a call, uh, uh, the, the context in the uh, called function, uh, like, uh, sorry, a call, let's say, mm -hmm. call a function, yeah. So that are, uh, but uh, uh, if we use the K probes, K probes uh, breaks into the, uh, the that context, so that the, and uh, save it, so that the, you can uh, yeah access it. Yeah, yeah, that that that, is, that makes sense, and uh, I didn't think of that. In fact, that indeed you know even the notion of trying to save them, you actually would be corrupting the state because you need the registers to um, to do the saving. So um, that makes total sense. Um, and so I'll, I'll have to, uh, I'll just have to just deal with that. Um, I don't think that's that's really solvable. Um, so thanks for uh, explaining that. Um, that's definitely a, a great insight. So another problem we run into is that when we have generated code, so C code compiled into PPF, the compilers generate valid code, but it's not something that can be validated by the verifier because it is based on certain assumptions that are not embedded within the code. Um, you know, again, what I mentioned with loops where you have uh, invariant relations between your registers, the compiler knows this as it is generating the code because it understands the higher level code. Obviously, the verifier doesn't have access to that. So that is another, another issue where we have to look at trade-offs. Should the compiler generate code that is known to be able to pass the verifier or should the verifier become smarter to be able to deal with code that has been generated by the compiler? And it's probably kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, so that is kind of an, an issue that will be ongoing. And so far, we're kind of tweaking code on the compiler side uh, to get around that because obviously the verifier is our limits in this case. And I'm sure uh, if you could correctly update the verifier to verify correct code, obviously you need proofs and a yeah. lot of work to update the verifier uh, because if the verifier is broken, then that that's all bets are off. So. I'm sure they'd be people would be okay for updating the verifier as long as you have the proofs behind your updates to show that what you've your changes are indeed correct. Yeah, and that's quite 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 a task, <laughs> but definitely yeah, that I agree. And then the last thing is, uh, and this is a crazy idea, and I wouldn't be surprised if it would get rejected on the spot just for even thinking about it. <clears throat> but there is the possibility to have um, BPF program validation done in user space with you know, a validator that is much more capable than the one in the kernel because of the fact that it you know can have use more resources. You can you know have it run for hours if needed to prove your program is correct. And then if there is support for being able to say, hey, I signed this program which proves that it has been validated by a validator that is accepted, um, that might be a way to have you know better verification and validation programs, but I have a feeling that's not um, something that would be acceptable to the people that are working on BPF. But it's it's a thought. 
it's I mean you could bring that up and but the thing is comes you know if you don't have it verified in the kernel you need something uh, who verifies the verifier yeah so it has you have to have some way and sign sign key I mean who what's the authority for that this is this key has been signed correctly so it's it gets you lose the key. It's, it's like IMA and so on you'd load a key you'd load a key into the kernel and the, and the key presumably has been provided by, provided by the people who did the signing and the people who did the loading would, have, would be trusting those people anyway, for whatever reason. We're not talking a central authority here. It's just key loading by the ad, admin, the same way these things always work. Okay. And then the admin would have to say that this has been verified and yeah. sign it. But then you have to go through and bother an admin. So it'd be, it's more of a process issue than, you know, it's partially processed as well as technical. Yeah. Anyway, um, time is up. So thank you. Virtual thank applause. Thank you. And we'll switch off to our next presenter, which I believe is Bo. Bo let's see. So um, let me. S switch. And switch slides. Actually, you good? Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Is this the one you want? Is this your slides? Yeah. Okay. You're off. Uh, You're on. <laughs> great. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about um, user mode applications in Linux um, sending diagnostic data to trace event. So today you have to use U probes essentially to get data. Um, from user mode into like an eBPF program, which we just talked about a little bit. Um, and that has its own issues uh, that we um, <laughs> kind of have to deal with. Um, so uProbes gives us the mechanism where um, we want to trace something and when something is not listening, um, we have very little overhead, right? So that's that's beneficial to us. So. We do want a way for user mode applications to send diagnostic data, um, but we also want it a way to, for it to work across multiple languages and binary types, um, which is not impossible with uProbe. It's just becomes quite hard for like something like C Sharp or JIT code um, or Java, where there's no clear um, like offset or even a, a place to patch a, a not to an int three. Um, and uh, we, we want a way for these user mode applications, um, whatever they emit out, to land in these um, standard tools, right? And standard tools mean like mainline tools like perf, um, ftrace, uh, eBPF. Um, we're trying to um, get things to line up behind eBPF. Um, uh, I, there was another talk about um, porting eBPF to um, Windows, which is a, a current work. Um, so we would like everything to land in eBPF eventually. Um, so this is our typical problem scenario that, that this problem is trying to address for us. Um, we have many processes running in across many C groups. They're all different languages, like I said. Um, we have a single monitoring agent um, that's running as root in the root namespace. And we go and try and enter those namespaces um, to gather all the data we require. So for U probes, we have to enter the namespace and figure out the real binary path from the mount space perspective because we're hooking in all the loads from perf events, which is giving us um, like the, the, na the per namespace or the per C group mount namespace um, pathing. Um, so we have to we have to enter and do all these jumps um, and dance to get everything to line up. Um, the other thing is we have uh, multiple teams and projects running um, multiple tools. Um, so you might have a team running LTTNG, for example, for their user mode data. You have other teams that are using uProbes. You have other teams that are um, up in the kernel. And uh, so we're trying to correlate all that together. So um uh what we want out of these uh, out of this discussion and this kind of solution that we're trying to target 
is um, consistent data across all these events. So um, if we stick in if we stick in kernel and we stick in UPro, we can get consistent data. Like we can get the PMU data that we want. We can get um, user mode stacks, kernel stacks. Um, we're really trying to avoid uh, having to mix technologies and have to merge and decode um, on the machine. There's some cases where we do want to decode on the machine, um, like live decoding. Um, that's when we typically use eBPF. And then there's other um, times when we want to uh, be ex extremely light on the machine. We monitor the entire machine and we egress that data off somewhere. Um, and so merging and decoding on the box are, are, are not something um, that's useful um, in terms of uh, cost or CPU or carbon. Um, and the last thing we really want out of this and is driving this is the not having to, like while we could have daemons and agents running in each namespace and doing some um, shared buffer or, or relaying data around to avoid the namespace, um, there's places where we run where there's many, many containers um, and the agents would become, you know, a burden to run and to keep um, like their memory, just just having them up, right? It's just the memory use is a lifetime, the potential for them to leave something in a bad state in a, in a namespace is something that, that we want to try and avoid. Um, so I, I've submitted uh, an RFC patch to the tracing development um, mailing list and uh, this is the this is kind of the proposed ABI um, that's in that patch and this is probably going to be the you know the core discussion I, I assume between us all is um, that if you have a user mode application running and you want to submit something directly into a trace event um, so there's so there's no um, u probe overhead cost to go from you know the int three to the die chain handler to go figure to you know run single step and then go figure out all this stuff um, that that can become quite costly compared to um, this ABI this approach, which is we have a, a file um, a tracefs file that's that's available um, that we would be able to uh, lock down um, as much or as little as we as we would like. Um, and once you get that file, um, you run an ioctl on it to register um, what event you want. So essentially, um, like in this case, we have a my user event, right? I, I run ioctl reg um, in the kernel. That reg is actually creating a trace point and it's creating a trace event class and it's wiring everything up. And the return value of that ioctl is the ID that you can now use. So it's not the actual. It's not the actual uh, trace event ID. It's like um, the user mode side of an event ID. And at that point, after that ioctl's run, um, you know, all the normal stuff lights up. So I can go see, you know, my user event in tracefs or perf or eBPF. They're all accessible as if they came from a kernel module. Um, and once the user program has that, uh, has that, um, has, has run that reg on the ioctl, they can call the right syscall to emit data. So this would be the same as if you enabled the, the inject um, kconfig uh, and um, were wanting to write a payload into an event. So um, you just call write the, that, um, like whatever is sent in that single syscall is replicated out um, to uh, perf, eBPF, um, F trace, whatever probe is currently attached to that trace event. Um, so you can't do multiple writes and expect that to show up. So you're limited on the uh, the data size of the of uh, the syscall for write. But um, for our cases, our, our data payload is pretty small, and I, I believe there's there's also limits in the uh, underlying trace event and buffers. I don't know if eBPF has a would theoretically have a limit. Um, and then the other thing is status. So um, status is interesting here, right? So you probe, you probe has its status by um, when you register, when someone registers to listen on an event, that binary location gets patched, right? Um, and in user mode, we don't have that mechanism, nor do we want to have to have a the die chain handler overheads and things like that. 
So there's a TraceFS file that's a MMMAP file. And the idea here is that the kernel will have a shared page or shared pages out that are, that are read only to the user. And as um, events are registered or probes are hooked, um, we update that map to represent um, bits that mean it's enabled or not. And the current idea is to have um, you know, bits zero through six um, be the mechanism in which the probe attached. I think there's currently only realistically two. There's the, the probe and the perf probe, although in the future there might be more. Um, so the thinking here is bit seven is reserved for others in case um, we have more than, more than seven that show up. And if nothing's listening, it's zero. So from the user mode code perspective, you just you just check uh, you check. Hey, is this is this page um, is this byte in this page non-zero or not? And that would tell you to do the right syscall. So when tracing is not enabled, all you do is you take a branch um, and hopefully you're labeling that un unlikely in GCC. And so it's a very very minimal impact when you're not tracing. And the way you know which byte to access in the events page is that return value from that IOCL is, is the event ID. And like I said, that event ID is a, is a pseudo ID. It's a user, user space ID. So if I call IOCL reg for my user event and event ID is returned one, it's, um, it's you know, array index one of events page is now representing if I should trace or not for that one event, my user event. And uh, currently in the patch, we reserve, um, we will never hand out an event ID of zero. Um, and that is for failure paths. Like, let's say um, this patch is not installed on your, on your machine and you have code in your user mode that's like supposed to be using this. Well, you can, um, you can handle the failure case like this is not installed. You can always wire up a page and you can say event ID is zero and you don't have to have additional branches in your user mode code to handle those cases. So you can, you can write, write it once and then ship it um, and not have to worry about, um, you know, like if it's there or not or if it'll work. And the advantage like of doing just these syscall approaches is that for, for managed code or any, any kind of technology, um, they're, they're very easy to map to, right? Um, I think the hardest one might be MMMAP, MM map, memory map, um, but all the other ones are, are very clear and straightforward to, to be able to, um, Get any kind of code um, to be able to participate in this uh, in this user mode space uh, admission. Uh, and then I have uh, this is the last slide, and I'm hoping to have discussion on this. Um, I haven't seen anything pop yet from the chat. Um, so, well, Sami has about... raised his hand, so oh. but you could finish. You finish if you want. Uh, Basabi, you want to talk now, or you want to wait? To, this is this last slide. Do you want to listen to this, or do you want to? Yeah. Um... I can wait. OK, so finish the slide, and then we'll have the discussion. Yeah, yeah. So this is, so this is the flow. Uh, I tried to represent this as simply as I could, um, just so it's very clear. And it's, it's, I don't represent the open or close uh, syscalls here. Um, but the idea, I guess I can use my pointer, and you guys can see it. Um, the, the process would start off with the user process opening the file, obviously. But then the first thing they would do is run an ioctl. Um, to create or register an event. This would then just go look up or create um, a trace event and um, trace point and dynamic events, um, you know, that whole song and dance at that point, if it's not already registered. Obviously, if it's already registered, we would just hand you back the ID that's, that's there. Um, this trace point, um, it, it updates the probe and perf probe to handle some proxy functions, which are right here, which are basically um, whenever this probe gets called, hey, I want to, like, if it's the normal probe, I want to run F trace. I want to, you know, get this data directly into F trace. If it's uh, a perf probe, then um, we have checks where it's like, hey, if, uh, do you have an eBPF program um, registered on this call? If you do, um, we pass the data, the user data directly to the eBPF program without um, any um, data copy. And we let the eBPF do the, the full probe copy from the user space into the kernel. Um, if it's not an eBPF, then we do do the probe uh, copies directly into the ring buffers um, in each space, the F trace and, and perf. And then when we write, um, the data just goes through and it just passes to those probes and then it, it calls into those proxies, which I've already described. 
And then this is the uh, the magic of the uh, events page, which is we have the probe register callbacks. We don't use the, the default probe register callback. Um, and we are, as things are coming in and out, we're ref counting them and we're updating this events page to represent the, the correct bits. So if your program's running, everything's cleared. As soon as uh, you run per for eBPF program attaches to an event that you're um, hit this event page just automatically updates uh, in all the programs and there's no overhead um, to doing that other than when the uh, the probe register callback is is invoked um, for an attach or detach. So I believe I believe that covers basically what what this thing is. So I'm hoping hoping to get some discussion and uh, questions on this. I'm actually very interested in hearing what Masami has to say because a lot of this. Uh, Touches the dynamic event work, and I and Masami is the main maintainer for that, along with Tom Sanusi, who I don't think is on. Yeah, so um, the first question is uh, um, Did you uh, consider to use the uh, trace marker? We already have uh, some uh, uh, similar system um, uh, interface that are to write the, uh, the data from user space into the uh, trace buffer. Yeah, of course, that this one <laughs> uh, doesn't uh, well, say provide any uh, uh, let's say, uh, event uh, ID. I think that there will be a, a fixed event ID. Um, so is that there, uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, not enough for your uh, usage? Yeah, so the missing part, like, we had a discussion with um, Stephen um, earlier, um, and he, he he mentioned that too. Um, I think the main point is like not being able to use the trace marker or inject or um, synthetic events is basically we need to know when to emit the data, right? So if if we were to use trace markers or synth or um, or inject, um, mm -hmm. we would have to have some mechanism to know when eBPF program has been attached or when perf has been attached or ftrace has been enabled on the on that event. Okay, I think um, the way I understood it, let no correct me if I'm wrong, is that they also would like to have like different events, you know, specific events that can be enabled and disabled by a um, third party process and attach things like BPF programs and such so that a uh, trace marker is like it's a Everyone could write to it, and it's just right into it. But the question is, can we trigger a instead of writing to the buffer, but trigger a EPPF program to execute or some other like you know, perfect? They believe what they told me was that they want all the bells and whistles that come with a dynamic event. So you could do histograms, you could do synthetic events, you could do BPF programs, you could do perf, ftrace, everything that comes with it. So you just create, it's basically a user mode event. I think what they want is U probes without the overhead of that breakpoint. Yeah, that I correct? see. Yeah. So those yeah. are, uh, you need, you also need to uh, say that there's some uh, argument data. I think it's done so, in the right, is that done in the right call? You define basically the arguments and, or you just say, I just have a blob and then whatever attaches to it. Yeah, yeah we were, go back to your one page, the ABI things. So uh, as far as I can see that our, it's, our, it's just pass our, uh, the string data. Is that enough yep. for you? So that's uh, that's what we're currently using, and we're trying to figure out. Uh, I know there's other topics today that are referencing argument decoding and BTF and things like that. So I'm interested to hear uh, the thinking on that. But right now, how we're using it is we have a, an anonymous blob, like Stephen was saying, um, and we decode it um, in the eBPF program through shared headers. So like when we build our tool. Um, we'll output um, headers that you can include in your EBPF program that will decode it. Um, that's how we're so, currently handling that. So that's our, uh, you can you can send our like a binary packet to our, to the uh, log and uh, it will check, uh, let's say it will be, let's say the format is, will be checked in the kernel, right? 
Yeah, I mean, the if you it, it depends what you're in eBPF, we we decode the whole packet in perf and F trace. The packet just is represented however it was called in the right call, and we don't muck with it at all. And in decoding, you, yeah, uh, this is uh, this yeah. is one topic I wanted to talk about uh, on the registration. So I, I like this ABI. It's just that on the registration. I mean, the, the specific case that is implemented there is uh, the type is a single field uh, presented as a binary blob. It would be good that this ABI is extensible so that you could say, OK, here are the various fields of this event, and those are the types, and that this can be, uh, 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 this, this can grow in the future. Uh, also, maybe log levels and things like that. On the registration, I, I think there should be extensibility there. Yeah, uh, so that yeah. are um, for that use case. Uh, yeah, I think that we already have a syn uh, synthetic event, so that uh, you can uh, uh, specify that uh, the data format with a synthetic event. So that uh, yeah, that is just one point. Uh, let's say uh, against that. Uh, uh, my, my concern is that uh, this uh, ABI. So you can. For example, you can uh, make a new uh, synthetic event, and uh, uh, maybe we can uh, add uh, the marker uh, interface for those uh, synthetic event, and uh, a user uh, will open that uh, this marker uh, inter uh, file and write it. That well, is when, yeah. So synthetic events like take a type of. I mean, we could create a format uh, API. So instead of like one thing, instead of the IOCTO or writing to a file, instead of just writing, here's my event, give me an ID, uh, we could probably define what, you know, have some sort of API that defines what the fields and everything for that. IP. We give named fields, data sizes, and you could just say an array. So you could just even still put in a binary blob, but call it something. Um, one thing I forgot that I, I don't think was mentioned here is they want normal user space to be able to do this. And one thing you can do that today with the normal set, you can actually make the TraceFS file system after you're mounting it into a, oh, by the way, I just realized that was three minutes. Um, the Make the normal file system in, owned by a group. You could set the you know, TraceFS owned by a group and specific files or owned by groups or writable so that a user could belong to that group and actually access it. And I believe that was acceptable if you could say, hey, non-root users can actually access this. And that's one thing we want to make sure. So creating a synthetic event and making a file. So one thing I kind of like about having this user events data is the fact that you could say users only have access to this one file that they can touch and not the synthetic oh. events because the synthetic events could create K probes and a whole bunch, you know, you open up a whole bunch of can of worms by giving a, the synthetic or the K probes or dynamic events uh, access to non root users. So, no one, um, no one can delete it. Okay. Right. So in fact, are, actually, in fact, actually that was one of the use cases. They don't want people to read it. They don't want those that write and create the events are not going to be the ones reading it. It's going to be the sysadmin that's going to be reading these events. So, you basically you start up this program in a user mode, normal user mode. All it has access to is that user events data. That's all it has access to. It creates the events that's going to uh, show up. It can't even turn on those events. Now, but the, when, admin uh, come in and turn those events on and see what these processes are doing. But, but uh, when are there these, uh, this event will be uh, removed? And uh, how we can list up uh, list it up. I think we had that as when the the file just when that file is closed, the event will be removed. Is that what we had? Well, so if the there's there's a red, there's a there's a there's an ioctal currently to to delete, and you can only delete if everyone's closed it down. So if it's not busy, you can't rip it out from from underneath people. So um, the other thing is all these events are isolated to a subsystem. Um, okay. To the Right, so they they are not like you can't just make something look like um, the scheduler tray, uh, ske uh, you know, schedule event. It, it, they're very clearly locked down, and there's only a certain amount of them, so that someone can't liquidate all the trace event IDs because there's only what two to the sixteenth, I think, um, trace events. Okay. Anyway, um, I think that are the uh, okay. Um, I see. Are the that the uh, proposed ABI will be okay? Um, what I uh, would like to add is uh, uh, to uh, 
Jose, or I think this one can be uh, uh, programmed on, over the uh, Jose, uh, uh, synthetic event. So that are uh, the passing that are the synthetic event uh, syntax uh, to the uh, IO control. Yeah, I think, okay, first of all, we're going to probably have to push this offline. And uh, Masami, I think you have some really good ideas and we could talk about this, but I think what we're going to do is uh, both let's resend those patches and maybe put into the notes here a link to the patches or in the chat uh, for what's, what's yeah, yeah. already proposed. Let's send it out. And Masami, now that you have a good idea of what's being proposed and the ideas behind this, let's continue this off onto the mailing list. And I think those are really good discussions. Thank you, Bo. I'm going to now uh, switch to the next, which I think is Dancho. I think you're up now. So, enter. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, and let me give you presenter access if I can find your name. That's right, you're a moderator, so you're up on top. You could have actually taken the presenter. Yeah, but that, ah, okay, and now I see the, the but, slide. Yeah, you're a presenter now, uh, so. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everybody. My name is Jordan Karajov, and I work for the VMware's uh, Open Source Technology Center. And uh, today I'd like to discuss with you uh, our different ideas for tracing containers. Uh, this actually the discussion will have a little bit to do with the actual tracing it's uh, more how to hook to a container but yeah let's move on so next slide so to today the containerized workloads are getting more important and uh, providing some uh, way of uh, seeing what is really going on inside some observability inside the workloads it's getting more important respectively uh but actually uh before we can even say that we are we will trace the container we need to define what is a container because as we will see in a minute uh the problem that we have to solve actually depends a lot from the our definition of container and it can be uh relatively uh, easy to solve in one case or very hard in another. So the first uh, definition of a container, which may sound ridiculous at first glance, is to say, okay, container is just this thing that Docker creates. Uh, but actually, if, if we stick to this definition, everything, it's much easier. Uh, like a small variation of this definition is to say, okay, container is everything that is compliant with the so-called opens open container initiative or OCI runtime specification, uh, which is again, so the Docker containers are compliant with this specification. So this is like a variation of the definition, but the, the more broad or loose definition to say, okay, container is just everything, which is a bunch of user space process, which are isolated in namespaces and are controlled by C groups or control groups. So if we choose this definition, then the, uh, the things are getting more problematic and we'll see this in a minute. So the, the, the first thing is, so tracing a container, uh, as we already mentioned, container is just a, a bunch of user space processes. Uh, so tracing a container is uh, in principle, not really different from just tracing a regular user space process. Uh, but the point is, so what defines the container is the, the so-called parent process, the, the first process which starts the container and all the processes inside the container are child of this process. So if we are tracing by the time when a container gets created, we, what we need is to get the process ID of the parent process and we need to, to get it as early as possible because we don't want to miss anything that is happening inside the container. And as I mentioned, creating a container is just a, a process of isolating the, in namespaces and then uh, giving the control to C groups. So there are uh, a very few system calls which are involved in this process. And if you trace the system calls, there is a straight uh, way to actually detect that a container is being 
created right now. So the first thing is you can detect when the uh, C groups are created because this is just a creating a directory inside the slash uh, C slash FS slash C groups. So if you trace this system call, you can uh, detect when a, a new control group is being created. Uh, uh, Joran, um, Christian yes. has raised his hand. Yeah. Yes. Christian, please call is it, is it okay to, to say something during the talk? I really don't Yes, it is, actually. I, I, okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, this is a, I, I, I'm sorry, this is a very annoying problem um, to define what a container is. I think that's, it's, from my point of view, the LNTT and G guys probably have to say something about this as well because they offer something like this, I think. Um, defining what a container is will be kind of difficult, and I don't think you will be able to cover all cases nicely without like inducing very high implementation costs. One easy suggestion that I've always made to people is to say a container is defined by running in a separate pit namespace. Because by the time you create a new pit namespace, you have a pit one, so you need to have an init, some form of init system that deals with and handles with signals. So anything that is, is separate from the host namespace, host pit namespace essentially runs in a separate pit namespace. I like to define that as a container, and this should make life way easier. Another option is uh, you introduce something which is um, something I thought about for a long time. It's a very, very simple concept. It's basically you tag a process tree or you tag a process with some sort of cookie. You think I would think it's kind of similar like the uh, core scheduling stuff, right? Where oh, you Christian, say, Christian, real quick. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I'm trying to take notes. So I missed your very first comment about the easy way of making of naming. Can you repeat I, that? I mean, this is very opinionated. Uh, but no, that's fine. I, I just want to write it down as notes. So you said you're the you easy say one. A container, a, a container is defined by a new pit namespace because in a new pit namespace, you're essentially the dead. I always like to define it as, as this is the point when you create a new system because you have pit one and this is responsible for reaping all of the children when pit one and pit namespace dies, all of the other processes automatically die as well. So this is a nice definition of what it means for something to be a container, I think. But this is very opinionated because we have workloads uh, in out there in Kubernetes and whatever it is that we nowadays all do, uh, where you share pit name spaces between different containers. And these cases will be hard to, to, to catch with this definition. Uh, I, I understand this. But from a, a tracing point of view, this is really nice because then you can say anything that is contained within this pit name space, all of the processes that belong to this pit name space form, uh, form a container. And it, it, it's very easy because you essentially have an internal tag for what a container is. And my more complicated, annoying um, proposal is to, to have a way essentially for a user service process. And this is vaguely related to what once was uh, proposed in form of the audit ID, where you essentially say, I'm allowing user space to set a tag like, for example, a process tag, but not in any elaborate sense, but you essentially mark a, a struct PID or something with a, with a given cookie and you say, this is a container, this is a cookie for the container. And every process that is spawned uh, of, of this initial process will get the same cookie. This is also a way to do it. But this requires kernel changes. Yeah. Actually, we are also thinking about uh, these kind of changes, but this was on one of my uh, next slides. But so yeah, what I was trying to say on this slide is basically in any possible sort of container, you always have some combination of the system calls which are shown here. So if you want to move into the, the process ID namespace, you can do this with unshare. That's what Docker is doing. You can also create the, the process directly with, within this namespace with clone, or you can use set NS. But anyway, so the, the, the system calls involved in creating a container are, are this one. So the list is not so long and one can uh, derive a logic which uh, will handle all the possible combination and orders of calling this system calls. And I think this, so this problem is not particularly hard to solve. I mean, when you are tracing by the time when the container is created. So we can solve this uh, problem even with, if we, if we take uh, 
uh, answer C here. So the, 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 the most generic uh, definition of a container. Uh, but then the next problem is, okay, what do you do if you want to hook to a container which is already running? So the, the system, the, those system calls are already gone and you have to find a way to actually retrieve the process IDs of all the process inside the container. So again, one solution, which at first look pretends to be, uh, Docker agnostic is to, yeah, to, to look into the C groups. Uh, but as you already, as it was already mentioned. Uh, actually, the, the container is not guaranteed to have any C groups. There are containers which are not using C groups. So that's the first place where this solution is already failing. And then if you have both C groups one and C groups two uh, file system mount, uh, the, the hierarchy is different. So on the slide, you can see the particular place where Docker places its C groups, uh, but if you are in the general case, then you have to do some sort of scan of the entire C group file system. And this is not so trivial. Yeah, it's, it's doable, but it's not sure that this thing can, can scale. Uh, the second thing is, yeah, if you are with answer A containing just this thing that Docker creates, yeah, that's where Docker, or in this case, container D actually, records the process ID of the parent process of the container. Uh, and they're actually, con so this particular path may change from different versions of Docker, but uh, container D actually provide tools for you for, to, to retrieve this. But again, this is only uh, for containers created by Docker. So it's not going to work in a general case. And of course, once you get the, the process ID of the, the parent process, you can figure out all the childs, of course. Another, possible approach is to just do some sort of brute uh, brute force of all the process running on the system. And if you check what is being mount, what, what are the mounts of each process, you can actually figure out the process which are mounting different container images. So th that's another way you can actually get a list of all the containers running on your system. Of course, you may have different uh, number of instances of the same container image running. Uh, but again, this can be figured out uh, with just looking into the in the prots uh, file system. So that's another solution which I'm not sure it's going to scale. And yeah, what we want to ask is: is there is there anything else that one can do? Is there anything that we are missing? And is there any standard way of doing this? Or if it doesn't, is it be uh, crazy to think about actually introducing some standard? for solving this type of problem? Yeah, Matthew, I see you want to, uh, to add something. Uh, yeah, just uh, one point. Uh, so in LTTNG, the kernel tracer, we trace uh, the containers by inode numbers. So this is really the unique system-wide number that, that can be applied. And then we were discussing PID namespace, which I think is nice. Uh, one thing we notice is missing is that the notion of a user given name to a container, uh, the kernel has no knowledge about it. So some kind of tagging that could be uh, uh, given by user space to a PID namespace might be really, really interesting for tracing purposes. Yes, I, uh, I, I thought about this when we did the, the PID of the API that you could essentially tag it uh, by, for example, introducing some way to write to the Right to the pit of D and say this is attack for the for the process or for this pit namespace. I would think this is I would think this is very useful because we need I, I can see the value in providing way for user space to essentially inform the kernel this is what I this is what my notion of a container is. This so doesn't the need to be anything fancy. So this is great. I love the fact that we seem to everyone's in agreement for basically some kind of tagging by user space saying, this is my container, these are the tags, this will, what well, I will label as my processes or whatever, or namespace or whatever not. Question is the action items. Just, just How will we get, the, or go on. Matthew. There was a lot of discussion on, in these slides about using the PID as an identity right. for the container. Be aware that if you have nested containers, the vision of the PID from user space varies depending on the point of view. So just be careful about that. Okay. Yeah. 
So. Yeah, but uh, anyway, uh, I think that uh, the usually uh, tracers will be uh, used from the uh, outside of the container, so that uh, the PID will uh, is uh, will be the good key uh, for the uh, for identify that the, the uh, namespace uh, or C groups. Uh, I think that are, I uh, we'd better to uh, split that uh, the namespace support and the uh, C group support. But uh, anyway, um, uh, except for the uh, network namespace, all the namespaces are uh, because it's related to the some tasks, so that they, their task can uh, trace, uh, let's say, uh, track back to the uh, the which uh, uh, let's say we can we can identify that the the which namespace, for example, uh, the uh, the the process is uh, let's say belongs. Uh, easily in, uh, in a kernel, so that are the uh, PID will be uh, PID from uh, outside of the let's say or root uh, namespace is a good idea, I think. So, having a what type of namespace was that, Sami? A root namespace, you said, or yeah, root, root namespace or the the outside of the namespace, so that are the the origin one. So, and, uh, okay. and uh, also, yeah, I would like to uh, ask you uh, about the the, uh, the idea, uh, this idea. Oh, this is this uh, for uh, tracing outside of the container or inside uh, from inside of the container. I mean that, uh, uh, for example, we we can mount uh, the trace APIs uh, inside the, the the container. Yeah. Okay. So, I have objections against tracing inside a container, unless it's a privileged container. If you have a privileged container and that has full access, fine. But I've knacked several patches that try to uh, trace from within a container, only the container, because once you get into the kernel, you're outside the container. And what's the definition of a container is to contain. And yeah. once you open up that tracing, you just opened up the container. It's, it's you could try it, but, because trace events and tracing is so, it's created by every subsystem, their own method, their own way, trying to filter out, you could white, maybe say white, or I don't wanna use the word white, but, but you know, just say this is valid trace points to attach, these are invalid trace points to attach. That, uh, that would be a nightmare to try to manage. That's my fear. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, and, for, for example, um, if you uh, if you use BPF, if you use BPF trace, uh, there is potentially a way which we've, we've shown that this works, uh, where you can. I don't want to go into this into detail, but essentially there is a way to make this work even for unprivileged containers. But you need a privileged container manager that supervises the system calls of the unprivileged container, and then for example, you can have a list of allow listed BPF programs, BPF tracing programs, for example, that the container can ask the container manager to load. This works. This is a way around this, if this really becomes a use case, but I don't think it will ever be possible to do tracing from an unprivileged container. It sounds dangerous. Uh, I think that tracing system calls uh, specific to the threads running within the containers might be a special case because this is so close to really what user space is doing within the container. That might be the only special case I see. And system calls are actually meta trace points anyway. So we could actually throw that in there and have it just something different, you know, just put them in a different category and say, here's, you know, or a different utility that could be done later. So my, so just want to follow up on. Uh, I have one more slide maybe. Okay. And Both we slides. were kind of already in a discussion on what I'm showing on my last slide. So yeah, basically, so what we want to, to take from the container, what is the, the valuable information that we want to extract? So the obvious things are, yeah, so the, the files which the container touches, what it reads, what it writes, the programs that are being executed, 
the libraries which are used. Uh, this, for example, this this problem: what are the libraries used by the container? It's interesting because, on one hand, you may want to optimize your image. For example, maybe your image contains a lot of stuff which you just don't need, so you, you can make your your image smaller. Uh, but it's also a security issue if you have a lot of stuff in your image which you actually don't use. This like the uh, increases your attack surface. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, problem that we can solve, I guess, with tracing. And then network connections. Uh, you can pro it will be very nice if you can somehow build a, a map of the services. I mean, how the different containers are talking to each other, what are the relations between the containers on the system. And this naturally evolves to tracing uh, containers on different nodes. And so that's basically everything I, I wanted to, to say to trigger the discussion, but the discussion already started. So, yeah. Are there any, any interesting things that we want to extract from the container? What do you think? I guess the, the question is, you know, purposes of container tracing. Yeah. So obviously, you know, what do you want? To, what would you like to see from tracing from a container? I don't know if people have thought of or everyone's in the same, just trace everything. Because what they were looking at is not just tracing container, but also tracing interactivity between containers on different machines. So that requires synchronization across, you know, and again, outside the tracing, it'll be on the host or whatever, or a privileged container would be doing this management. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I noticed, I mean, we have trace points in the kernel, we have uh, more detailed function tracing and things like that. So everything that is really kernel specific. So, so you're talking about, let's say, tracing network connections. So tracing a container, I see the important part as being the interaction of the processes within the container with the kernel. So again, system calls, rather than looking at, let's say, the, the, the packets that go on to the network interface. So, so it, it's important to know, really look at where we want to, to gather that information. But there's, there's other ideas. But right now, I think one thing I'd like to ask, because it was in discussion now, and this is kind of important, this tagging mechanism that we want to do, what what action item can we do? Christian, do you, can you go out, you can say, hey, I have a patch to write. You're the one that's probably most involved in this field. Uh, it depends on what, uh, what the most uh, useful, the most useful solution is. I don't, what uh, is, because I see uh, Masami proposing a bunch of stuff with uh, echo mountainous pit into set namespace, what is this supposed to be? This is uh, in tracing FS or? Uh, Sami, do you want to reply? Yeah, uh, it's a, yeah, uh, my idea is a, you know, on our uh, trace surface. But uh, of course, that's a, uh, we need to some more uh, similar interface for uh, PERF for something, some other uh, subsystems. But uh, my idea is actually very uh, simple. So that are, uh, with the some, uh, the, the target namespace and uh, uh, the PID will, uh, are us to uh, make a filter for the uh, container, um, like a namespace. Is that safe again? You mean the, the, the I not number of the of the namespace to be used as filtering? That's what what you are proposing, Masami. Sorry. Uh, the the I not number of the process. Of the, the the namespace that, of the process to be used as yeah yeah, yeah. I know that that's a PID for tutoring. So that are it's easy to uh what say find that for user. Uh, yeah, of course uh, there is some uh, interface to show that are there each uh, inode uh, for the uh, each uh, namespace. Uh, yeah, I'm okay for that, but uh, usually that are the namespace, when we make a, for example, PID namespace, uh, how we can uh, find that uh, the inode number? It is, but uh, for the user, uh, maybe user want to uh, trace that the one process or uh, also the, the container including a uh, specific process, so that are, <laughs> the user want to use that are the PID to trace that. I guess. 
Uh, maybe Brockdef is will export that. Yeah, of okay. course. So the, in that case, that's the uh, I know that it's also okay. So Masami, we just have one minute left. I think what you are describing here is the filtering mechanism at the tracer side. Yes. Uh, the question that Stephen is asking to Christian is about tagging uh, semantically uh, a container, a PID namespace, let's say. Oh, I see. Yeah, that is also yeah, yeah. true. Rat slash proc or to tracers. Hmm. So, so in our, yes, just data, to finish data. up, since we, so I think we probably need to start closing up because it's about time is up. Be, and be, one one last thing I want to say because I uh, I haven't looked at the implementation right away, but we are, now we have some sort of mechanism for this already, right? I mean, this is how core scheduling works, right? There is a cookie associated with a group of tasks. We already kind of have a label for a for a process that you can set from outside. Not the same, but it's the same principle. Okay, so I haven't shared notes. I didn't quite get everything. So if those that were discussing stuff, please go review the I actually put Masami, I didn't quite get your suggestion at the end. If you want to add to it, Christian, please feel free to add more to the shared notes. And uh, right now I think it's time for a break. So 15 minutes um, and then we'll be back. I definitely need a coffee. Uh, okay, so the first topic I want to discuss uh, with you guys today uh, is about trace points. Uh, so, uh, and one specific use case of trace points is for system call tracing. Um, so, uh, we present the problem. Uh, so, what we try to achieve here is to reliably capture data from a user space memory whenever we are tracing system call entry and exit. Uh, so we, what we want to do is to do something similar to S-Trace, but without the huge overhead associated with scheduling other threads and coming back and forth between processes and doing P-Trace peak from uh, remote uh, processes. So the major issue there uh, is handling page faults from tracer callbacks because the current code, uh, well, because that requires the code to be both sleepable and to be able to take the MMAP semaphore. Uh, so that typically happens uh, when, uh, so, so the way to trigger this uh, very commonly, uh, whenever you are doing uh, uh, system call tracing uh, from, from the tracers, uh, so you either exec or DL open a, uh, a executable or a shared object, and the input argument, let's say you have a open app syscall and you want to trace the, the string that is the path that you want to open. Uh, quite useful, quite uh, quite important in order to track whatever is being read or written to files. Well, if you put that string into the data segment of your executable, uh, so that will be uh, paged in on demand uh, whenever the first access is done. So if that first access is done by the system call, the first system call that is done, open that, and that happens to be done by the tracer, uh, the tracers currently uh, won't be able to take that page point. Uh, so this can also happen if you, uh, even if you have uh, some, let's say, uh, dynamically allocated memory that holds the parameter meter in user space, and your system is under high memory pressure, so that can be uh, that page may not be available. So the current stages, so the trace points allow in kernel tracers to work on system call entry and exit. The trace points, however, they disable preemption around the entire invocation of the callbacks. So we iterate on an array of callbacks and we call them one by one <clears throat> with preemption disabled. Uh, so that prevents the kernel tracer from handling page faults. Uh, EBPF and LTTNG, whenever they are attached to trace point that allow, uh, so, uh, so they allow re reading user space data, uh, which is pointed to by the system call arguments. But the strategy they currently use is to zero pad the data whenever they would have to take a page fault. So you have missing information in the traces. Uh, and since the kernel 510, eBPF supports sleepable programs, but uh, as far as I know, they cannot currently attach to trace points. So the solution I'm proposing is to extend the trace point and trace event APIs to allow the, uh, and by I, I mean uh, both Mikael, Janson, and myself. So we are working to the, together on this batch set. So uh, um, 
So it's to extend the trace point and trace event APIs to allow defining a faultable trace point uh, that will invoke its callback with preemption enabled. So, uh, so, so both sides there need to know that the preemption will be enabled. So both whatever is defining the trace point and doing the calls and the tracers uh, uh, exposing the callbacks, those callbacks need to know that preemption is enabled because this is a completely, uh, complete different uh, execution context. Um, so the trace point probe registra uh, registration APIs. So we propose to uh, extend it to have a, a trace point probe register mayfold. So, uh, so the tracer registering the callback, uh, so it, its callback knows that the pre preemption is enabled. And uh, the trick there is to use uh, the, the, the task trace RCU mechanism, uh, uh, which has been uh, contributed into the Linux kernel by Paul McKinney. Uh, to synchronize the read side marshalling of the registered probes for the syscall entry and exit uh, events uh, with respect to uh, the probe, uh, those portable probes on registration and tear down. Um, but doesn't task uh, trace RC idle aware and all that stuff? Uh, sorry, Peter, I missed part of what you said. Can you repeat that? Isn't task trace suffering from all the old RCO problems that it's not idle aware and it will disturb all CPUs and, and all the other nastiness? Uh, I, do I, yeah. I don't think, wait, um, so you're talking about um, the issue like we had in this, I believe, in the other talk about um, hitting like no hertz full task stuff uh, because those RCO the task RCU is aware of uh, no hertz full and does not interrupt do anything with um, uh, tasks that are running in user space. If a task is in your space, it's a quiescent state, so it just ignores that CPU. If that's what you're asking, Peter. Okay, so but then how is it different from regular preemptible RCU? Uh, you can uh, you can take a page fault, so you can actually sleep, not just be preempted, but actually sleep. So the quiescent st states are you're in user space or are you voluntarily called schedule? You were regular. But, so it will wake up all the idle CPUs. No. Oh, and idle, uh, idle CPUs are also, yeah, I believe idle is a quiescent state or you have to, yeah, I believe so. It's not going to, it doesn't actually call or wake up anything. It just checks to make sure that I believe idle state is a quiescent state, or we probably have a quiescent state in the idle uh, when you switch into idle. Basically, it says you're not going to it. But wait, if you do a page fault, a page fault that schedules, can't page faults call schedule? That's yep. not a preempt. Nope. So that's not, that's a, that might not, are you sure tasks RCU? As I recall, and I, I've looked at this a year ago, okay, so <laughs> bear with me. But as I recall, the strategy there is to have a much slower implementation in terms of synchronize, because I, I recall it kind of iterates on all tasks. So it, it's not a per CPU approach, it's a per task approach. Right. So, and that right. allows that to fault and to have some longer uh, uh, read sides and things like that. But, it, it, well, so, but it's not per CPU in there. No, because the task, okay, the task RCU that I asked Paul to submit was for the uh, trampoline logic, because you can never know when a task is on, the trampolines will never schedule out, will never well, call that's, schedule. That's task. But task. That's, is this, that's a task RCU, so this is task trace, it's different? Trace yeah. Yes, they're different. They require okay. from uh, both the EBTF guys and myself, where we wanted to be able to sleep and take page faults within uh, the read site. Oh, so basically you're saying you do only if you do schedule, but you can actually take a page fault, but the page fault could call mutex. Yeah, and that's fine. And then that's actually a sleepable. So it's actually, what is the question state for this? So, that, so then why is this better than SRCU? Uh, it's faster. So SRCU could achieve something similar, but the read side is slower than task trace RCU. And by the way, do you know that we've actually kind of solved this with the event probes that we just added uh, to 5.15 that just came out. Uh, what we've done is using synthetic events, we were able to attach the entry of the system call to the exit of the system call to create a, a new system call that has information from both the entry and the exit. 
but it gets triggered on the exit side. So you can actually get the return of the system call information as well as the parameters. And we use the event probes to overlay and say, hey, this pointer, give me the string. And because it's on the exit side of the system call, the whatever was referenced has been mapped because the system call had mapped that. And so far we haven't, I mean, there is a race condition that we could actually have that whatever got mapped got faulted out again, which is highly unlikely, but possible, theoretically possible. But we've actually been able to uh, see all strings now that we are interested in because we look at all the system calls that have strings. We just create a synthetic event that will attach the start and end of the system call and then just read the system call and then convert it to a string on the exit side and the string is there. So we've actually have all the information we need um, as of 515. Okay, uh, that would be interesting to look at the details because uh, for instance, exec, which can change ABI between the entry and its exit and the syscall number changes. So that can be tricky. Uh, okay, you also yeah, exec would be interesting. I haven't really taken a, well, wait, this, well, because it is the system, I mean, it still returns, but I have to take a look at it. I believe it would, it's, the process ID is still the same because we usually map it by process ID. So system call entry, system call exit, and process ID is the mapping. So whatever, and since you're not going, it's going, should keep the same process ID. I mean, fork will create a new process, but uh, usually forks don't have things that we usually need to um, save because we have the information from the actual fork trace point. But that is something that we have, that's our way of getting around the, uh, you know, extracting information from the system call. But you, you end up in the same kind of situation where you you have to, to, to be able to take a page fault. Oh, no. oh, you take it after the system call has completed, so the fault has already been taken. Correct. Well, usually. I mean, th it might happen that you raise with high memory pressure and it's removed as well. I said that th that's theoretically possible, but we have yet to see it, ha it happen in practice. You may also race with the system call uh, output arguments overwriting the input arguments, and there, then you never see the right input arguments. What do you mean? If uh, the parameters passed to the system call happen to point to the same memory for input and output, then you never get the input. Well, which system calls do that? It's not the typical use case, but someone could do this. If, if they want to evade tracing, if they right. want to evade seccomp or I mean, if it's all based on this kind of mechanism, only at exit, you might end up in weird situations. Like you said, see, maybe we could take a look at this, but say right now, uh, we've actually overcome it by using the situation. And actually, as a caveat with this, I will disclaimer that I do say that synthetic events require mapping and tracing, which there is a bit of overhead attached to it. So it is a little bit slow that the normal system probably would do this, but then we don't have all the synchronizations that we have to worry about. Uh, um, you're cutting a little bit away. I don't know if it's my connection or yours. My connection. It, hold on. I mean, am, am I still choppy? No, that's good. Okay. For some reason, I don't know why I have supposedly a good network connection, hopefully, but I guess it's just from me to the server. I think it likes to pick people and just say, because I still have red on mine, my side. Um, but that's just to let you know about that. Well, other than that, um, we could take a look at it and see. Because this is something we also each trace point. I mean, are you going to do this for every system call would have this be a may fault uh, trace point? Yeah, so so the initial plan is that the syscall entry and exit trace point would would really become may, may fault trace point. And then all tracers and we have this in our patch set, all the tracers initially are modified so that they register may fault probes, but at the beginning and end of their probe implementation, they disable preemption. So it, it, it's the exact same behavior as before, uh, but it allows the caller and the callees to support uh, preemption and, and taking page fault, and thing, things like that. I mean, I'm not against the idea, just we could take a look at it. I don't really have, I don't know, Peter, do you have any other issues besides one thing to make sure that the task RCU synchronization does not touch uh, you know, CPUs that are either idle or in user space doing no hertz full or user space general. Yeah, or API heavy. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to look at the task trace RCU as far as BPF is the only magical user of that thing. 
as of now. But. Okay. And, and, and I mean, if, and if, if you're taking yeah. folds, then who cares for folds? We'll see. So I guess Peter, he chopped down there, but I think I translated him, him saying, if you're taking faults, who cares about performance? Oh, but the common take, uh, the common case don't need to fault. So we want complete yeah. solution, but uh, as 99.9% as .9 of the scenarios are not going to need to fault, then we want that fast. We want yeah, then you can do it as a several two stage. Then you can do the uh, copy from user in Atomic, and then if it faults, you can do the complicated things. Yeah, but you still need to fault. <laughs> in, in well, the okay, so this was actually one of the things I originally posted as a, because I was trying to get it so S-Trace could actually tack, you know, go using perf, could use perf to actually do the tracing and not have to do its own faulting. And I can't remember, Linus told me an answer and I actually forgot what his answer was. It was ingenious too. And I, I have to go back and ask him again. But uh, I had an idea where you would just do the record and if it faulted, it just set a flag somehow. And then at the P trace exit, it would then finish the, it would do the magical faulting as well. But is there, or if we could say, just do it. And then if it does, don't, don't do the trace point if you try to read the information, but then there's issues like an F trace where we allocate the buffer before to write, to prevent the multiple copies we write right into it. Of course, and for these situations, we could just make a copy because we do have ways of having a helper buffer to write into the buffer and then, and then allocate if possible. So you could write everything into the buffer, but if something faults, just say, okay, do the other method as well. I don't know, if, but no, if you're always the on buffering. I mean, if you want to do early filtering before writing to the buffers, uh, let's say with eBPF, uh, then you want eBPF to be able to immediately immediately take the page fault so it can decide whether you need to trace that or not. Well, if it takes a page fault, then it won't know if it should trace or not. I mean, well, if it takes if if the page fault happens, well, I mean, yeah. So I said you go to switch to the other mechanism. But I have to take a look at the code again. So I take it you had the patches already sent out. Yeah. Yeah. So put in the link um, for where those patches are, at least in the chat or in the notes. So, uh, uh, last slide is references. And the patch is uh, foldable, foldable trace points v2, the RFC patch that uh, Michael Janssen sent last year. Uh, so we have the, uh, and now, uh, the, so, so, what maybe could be done is that eBPF could adapt and uh, based on that patch uh, could enable uh, faulting and sleeping for the, 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 the system, system call entry and exit trace points. Uh, so this is maybe something that could be done on top as well. So that's what I have. Other questions or Peter? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the idea. I just yeah, need to look at the implementation. Good. Yeah, as I recall, the, the task trace RCU is really, so it's a per task approach to RCU. Uh, so, which means a much slower synchronized RCU, but it was not a requirement from EBPF uh, nor myself uh, to have a fast synchronized RCU. So, whenever you trace, the fact that your grace period might take a bit longer and be a bit, bit more heavyweight uh, was not really a concern there. So, based on that, we could go with a, a per task approach and then uh, allow those tasks to take page faults uh, and sleep while within a RCU read side critical section. Well, that's what I have for this presentation. Uh, Stephen, do you, do you have other uh, things uh, or anyone? No, I'm just trying to write notes and get everything in there, so. Um. Right, so reading from the, the commit that asked, adds RCU task trace, it says, or of course, downsides the grace period code can send IPIs to CPUs, even though CPUs.
that are in Earth user space. Okay, so you don't want, we have to fix that before we can use this, and or actually, yeah, that's got to be fixed. Yeah, I mean, it, it shouldn't even exist in the first place, but I, I really hate that we're adding new RCU flavors that don't play nice with no hertz full. So let's uh, let's involve uh, Paul McKinney in this. Maybe so. Maybe it's just a limitation of the initial implementation. Let's yeah, we'll have to discuss that with him. What's it called? Trace task or trace or task trace RCU? Uh, RCU tasks trace. It's called RCU task trace, whatever. And I think he renamed it at some point. So yeah. So it's either task trace RCU or RCU task trace. Well, we got five minutes. So if you want, we could. Uh, I'm sure you could give your other talk if you want, or we could take a five minute break. Want another five yeah. minute break? Yeah, we can go for the five minute break. Uh, I'm fine with it. Okay. So, hey everyone, if you want to refresh your coffee and we'll take a feedback in five minutes. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Feel free to update the notes too. I said I wouldn't be drinking as much coffee today, but I guess I shouldn't be drinking as much coffee, but too bad. Um, how to pull up again with my plumber's cup. So, Matthew, it looks like you're on again. <laughs> Right. Yep, I'm there. Yep. So, it's the top of the hour. Here's your results. And the next one is your platform here, huh? Yep. And let me go and I should be right there. Give center again. Set. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, do you want to present something? Uh, no, I'm or... done. No, it's, your, okay. it's all yours. Thanks. Uh, okay. So last year I talked with Stephen uh, about the uh, situation about the LTTNG, uh, the tracer uh, being out of tree. So uh, part of it is a kernel tracer, part of it is a user space tracer. So now we are fo focusing on the kernel tracer. Uh, so Stephen uh, tried to review uh, some some version of it that I sent to him for upstreaming uh, last year, and he found out that uh, in 15 years of project history, that creates a lot of code, and it takes a lot of time to review. So now the approach we are trying is to uh, find a minimal subset of LTTNG that uh, the kernel tracer. Uh, which can be uh, useful uh, for the upstream kernel. Uh, so, uh, and what we identified there is that uh, one key thing that the LTTNG kernel tracer can do is to perform fast tracing of system system calls with their input and output argument payloads uh, in a way where uh, we can take the page fault actually. Uh, so the current upstream ring buffers cannot handle page faults uh, while we copy the user space data in the buffers. Uh, and uh, so that would require, uh, for instance, either doing a pre-copy stage before copying to the buffers. So that be basically precludes uh, zero copy approaches. So in terms of uh, speed, uh, it's not uh, ideal. So the current stages, uh, the upstream tracer ring buffers are tuned to for their specific use cases. Uh, so perf, for instance, is specialized for sampling. It can also do other things, but really the, the main uh, initial use case it, it's been specialized for is sampling uh, PMU counters. Uh, F-trace is specialized for tracing at high speed with preemption disabled. Uh, and uh, none of those upstream tracers allow uh, reading uh, user space uh, data reliably. So, so if we talk about perf and F-trace, they, as far as I know, they only take uh, the register contents and save that uh, in the trace buffers. Uh, so they do not read uh, user space memory data. ABPF use zero padding fallback whenever a fault would occur. 
And uh, so, and other system call tracers such as P-Trace, uh, based on P-Trace such as S-Trace, uh, are slow because of sc scheduling and P-Trace uh, peak overhead. I, I will just say that, you know, with the, uh, yeah, by default, because it just uses the, whatever the parameters are passed in, if it's a pointer, it's a pointer. So, but for data, as I mentioned, we have code that does the event probes and such uh, that can extract data. And that's for perf as well as F-Trace. From user space? I mean, extract it from user, well, I mean, user space tracing or from, yeah, the data, like the file names that you pass in, the pay, the faulting stuff. Remember, I told you it gets faulted by the system call, then it's accessible. We just reads it. Uh, uses uh, uses the um, K Pro mechanism of saying you, uh, K Probes now has a, um, uh, what's it called? And a, the API tells you this memory is user space. So it uses the user space ways to extract that code from a K probe. And uh, same thing for U probes and F uh, with the event probes, we do the same thing. Get this and get this from user space. And if it faults, it just says it faulted and you can't read it. But like I said, if it, and that's from K probes and U probes, but if, if you get it from the end of the system call, most likely it's been faulted in and it's accessible. So that's, that's okay. what I'm saying. But you cannot add the event at the timing of the beginning of the system call with the faulted in payload. Well, you get um, you get all the way like you said it uses synthetic events, which takes two events and put them into one. So you get all the data, including the timestamp of when the first event happened, and the second event. And actually, you can even have as part of your event the delta of the two events. Okay. So, uh, so one uh, possibility, so uh, I'll have to look a bit more at uh, what Stephen uh, just uh, talked about, the synthetic event approach, uh, to see uh, how it uh, compares to what I'm proposing here. Um, so uh, the proposed solution I'm bringing here is a new tracer based on the components of the LTTNG kernel tracer uh, relevant to this use case. Uh, namely the LTTNG ring buffer, which is designed to uh, to allow, uh, well, which has been designed to be used from both kernel and user space context and allow preemption and page faults. Uh, and uh, also the ABI uh, or an ABI derived from the LTTNG kernel tracer, uh, which would allow interaction with the existing ecosystem uh, of user space tooling around the LTTNG. Uh, so basically exposing com concepts compatible with the LTTNG uh, tracer user space tooling uh, and the common trace format to be consumed by trace viewers. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically one possibility, but uh, I'd have to look at the plus minus compared to the, well, I mean, uh, Stephen, you, you said that there was overhead associated with the synthetic event approach, right? Yes, I, but I haven't really measured all the overhead. There is a little bit more overhead because of it, but there's also lots of room for improvement in that overhead as well. Because one of the goal there is to really have a, a, a blazingly fast uh, syscall tracer, uh, so low overhead as well. Uh, so that might be one argument for uh, taking the page faults whenever necessary uh, in the tracer, uh, in, well, in the tracer probe. I was so, actually looking for the the patch set for that, or the so to pass it to you. I'll... Yeah. Thanks. So some open questions. Uh, so uh, how do we implement the code which copies system call arguments into the buffers? Uh, so currently the LTTNG kernel tracer approach is really, and it's kind of historic in a way because it, we started implementing the trace point. Uh, uh, callbacks and then on top of this uh, trace point callback macros we implemented the system call specific uh, uh, syscall input output argument uh, fetching macros uh, but if we only upstream a system call entry and exit tracer then open coding might be another, another approach where we provide static alignment or macro helpers uh, to, to, to fact to, to uh, put together the common code uh, and we just uh, implement each of the of the syscall probes. Um, so, but uh, ideas uh, are welcome uh, in, in in this uh, on this side.
and of course the other part is uh, i mean considering the history of uh, uh, putting effort to uh, put something in shape for upstreaming and seeing that oh there's no time for review uh, and that stalls there and uh, so so is this project scope reasonable and uh, is it reviewable in a, within a reasonable effort and does it bring enough value to the kernel of course uh I'm I'd like to hear about more people than just like myself, like saying, okay, I'll review it, I'll pull it in. I was like having other people of interest inside the kernel community that would like to have this, or if they have customers or uh, Google or Facebook, you know, Amazon, all these um, groups or Red Hat be interested in this. And <clears throat> so kind of like how Thomas Gleichner when he's pushing real time, he says, I don't want to just push this just because I'm the only one pushing it. Uh, he wants Linus to say, you know, there's going to be other people here. So is it just going, is it just, you know, okay, we get LTTNG, is it just you? I, I'm hoping to have um, more groups saying, like, so when you present this, getting more interaction from other people. I saw Masami just about to start. Oh, Masami, you have a thought about that? Yeah. Um, so our, uh, to get the uh, the the copy uh, will be uh, let's see uh, the you mean that uh, we need uh, some kind of uh, argument types information for that uh, because which argument uh, is uh, user space or not um, must be said before that and uh, uh, also uh, uh, what kind of data uh, you need to trace uh from the user space for example uh maybe most of the io control will need a uh, io city will uh you know faster uh, some user data but uh, most of them are the data structure yeah and uh, is there any <laughs> reason to let's say a trace that the such kind of data user data space uh, user space data structure well, you just need to copy that there are some storings in a user space. So uh, I, we are currently in the LTT and G kernel tracer, we have not gone through the trouble of uh, doing the PRCTL stuff, for instance, but we have done things like ePoll, and those are arrays of bits being set or not set and things like that. The weight, uh, the ePoll weight also, we have done it. So that we, really, can require custom code to basically fetch whatever is in user space and put that in a formatted way, binary way, uh, within the trace buffers. So, so there's two parts of it uh, to it. So part, one part is having the metadata describing the layout of the fields, and the other part is having the code that serializes the uh, the syscall uh, input or output arguments into those ring buffers. And e even in LTTNG. So part of it was done with macro, uh, macro which described uh, integers, uh, strings, uh, those are the easy ones. But as soon as you get into more complex types, you, we, we had to, open, to basically open code that. So, it, so it's near, so it's close to a system call implementation in some way, but its only task is to copy the input argument uh, that it fetches from the system call arguments into the ring buffers. Have you thought about using BT, uh, BTF? I mean, that's where I'm focusing. In fact, we have a talk that's coming up at um, in an hour, I think, um, that mm -hmm. with the function tracing of arguments, which is going to be is focusing on getting this information from BTF. So if you have BTF defining the arguments of all system calls, and also I'm not sure, sure if we could actually even put in, if BTF could actually do anything with ioctals depending on what the ioctal is. And ioctals probably you don't really care for because ioctals are just pending. I don't know if, does strace handle ioctals? Um, that's like a really big can of worms because it depends on what file you're opening. So you have to know what file is being opened to know what ioctals are available, but PR control and stuff like that. Things, a simple a system call that itself has a lit, uh, set, um, a defined set of data structures and how they're read and everything else. I'm assuming it could be defined by BTF. And I think if you're gonna have any sort of metadata, use BTF, because that's already there. In fact, it's already in the kernel today that describes the arguments for functions. Yeah, that's something definitely we'd have to look into. Yeah, uh, that's a good idea, I think. Yeah. BTF 
yeah, currently I'm uh, looking for the, uh, let's say, uh, looking at the BTF, but uh, yeah, that will uh, help to describe that uh, what the kind of data will be passed uh, via system calls. Yeah. And that's already in the kernel, and that's already kind of like everyone's going that way. So I wouldn't use anything, any new type of uh, format. BTF is seems to be where everyone's focusing their time on. So, and that also gives you access to a lot more information other than just system calls. I mean, there was um, I watched the BTF talk. Um, I don't know if Alan's still here. I don't know. Let's see if he's. Um, yeah, Alan's here, but he gave a talk, and he wants to see you know tracing local variables of functions and inline functions. And I recommended that, you know, you create, cause that's 30 megs of data and people don't want that, you know, 30 megabytes of data inside the kernel. Cause that memory is used and not used for anything else. Once it's not mappable, we can't swap it out. But if you had it, something like that information in a module that you can only load, like I want to do tracing of specific, specific information, be able to have a module loaded in while you do it and then it's there when you need it and you can remove it when you don't want it anymore. Um, but system calls could probably be the same thing, you know, have the information put in somehow either through module or just I don't know how big all system call information would be. And you could also make it specific, how much data you want. You could, I think a little bit more control using modules uh, load. All that, that brings an interesting question. I mean, I've been maintaining out of tree modules for 15 years. Uh, I'm currently proposing to push something into the kernel. Uh, so your proposal is to have kind of something that can be configured as mo as modules, but sits within the Linux kernel tree. Yes, but but the thing is using BTF. Uh, that's one of the things that we have. If we could have a way, Al Alan's coming on, so hopefully get his comment. Alan, are you there? Or? Yeah, sorry, I just missed the last when I ch switched on the audio. I missed the last twenty seconds of that, so sorry, I, oh. I missed a bit of the context there. Uh, no, we're just talking about module uh, using the being a, having maybe a standardized way of loading BTF information into the kernel. I know you were interested in that in your talk to get the local variables. Uh, is that something you still think you have doing that type of? Yeah, I mean, I think it's feasible. Um, and as you were saying earlier, not everybody's going to want that, but I think for some use cases, it is something that will be useful. Um, I'm also thinking about ways that we can kind of dynamically infer type information at various instruction offsets within functions. I mean, one of the things that is really painful at the moment is when you get a kernel crash, trying to reconstruct arguments from whatever point in that you crashed at. But because we have BTF now, and because we know the, the arguments return values of functions, there's probably a certain amount of in, inference we could do to figure out what's in the various registers when the system crashes. Because doing that stuff by hand is a nightmare, and it's what everyone's been doing for years, and it's just su such a difficult process. So I think there's a huge amount of scope for using BTF to solve some of these problems, because we're carrying it around with us everywhere. So I think it's the way to go, definitely. Okay. So... So Matthew, I'm saying you don't. You could make it part like compiled in part of the kernel. I'm not saying to keep this mod, uh, you know, doing this as a external, um, uh, away from out of tree again. This is something just when I say module because we don't data that's inside the kernel can't be swapped out. It's m memory used, and if no one's using it, you're just wasting someone's memory. And I, I'm very concerned about that. I know. I see some other subsystems saying, no, oh, it's just, you know, memory is cheap. I'll just use this memory. But I'm like, oh, it's not cheap everywhere. So I like to have options of being just don't load it on demand if needed and um, not elsewhere. So as for this, I mean, I said for this to be pushed forward, I'd like to see who else is, who else wants it. It's not just you and I that's discussing this. Like, okay, you need me to review it, me to pull it in. I. I'm going to be like, um, quote unquote, you know, Linus, Linus Torvalds with Thomas Collectioner, where he says he wants people to show that it's going to be used by, or it's wanted by a group of people and not just, you know, yeah, we, a lot of people use this so far, but see what the scope is. I, I want more visibility of who's, who's the stakeholders. So, so one thing I noticed in the earlier presentation about container tracing, so that system call tracing facility could be exposed uh, for being used uh, from within a container to trace the container yep. itself. 
at this so, so a few things is if you can make like I said, make it eat simple. Like when we you know the real time patch is the biggest out of tree patch set that's been held out. I mean, I know you've been out of the tree for a long time, but you know, real time patch was two thousand four. And one year. Whatever one year later, LTT and G. Yeah. <laughs> But it it did it affected probably a lot more, and it it everything that came into the kernel, including F trace, was completely rewritten when it went in, and it was done in small little chunks. And I've always said things are not pushed into the kernel; they're pulled. And everything that we went into the kernel was wanted to wanted by the developers. We convinced them this is what you want, and it's not just saying here, please review. Is this what you want? We actually kind of said make this and like the macro i have to see i have to go back and look at the code but i mean if it's in smaller chunks and not just this huge thing that you know break it up so with a defined you know defined objective of what it's to accomplish say you do this you get this and reasonable broke up that it makes sense to see the steps in there and not just lots of code You're like okay where do i start so my initial uh, step would be, for instance, to provide uh, uh, open at and close a system call tracing, detailed tracing implementation, just to show how things work. Uh, have an unknown syscall where we just capture the registers and that's it. And if we're okay with that, then we could build uh, and basically trace more system calls and more details. So, so I, I'd start really small just to show the value and then we can agree, decide uh, what we, we, we agree yeah. on. That, that's actually something that I, yeah I agree with that approach. Uh, let's just see where we're at here. So we're at the five minute mark. So just to whoops wrong. Yeah, and Magic. and by the way, uh, I, I thought about it since last year. And what, one thing I would do is, even if we have an ADI that is somewhat similar to what LTTNG module is exposing today to its user space, uh, I'm really open to make changes that makes makes it better. And I'd even expose it as as let's say, a, a different placeholder. So it would not be the same tracer. From our tooling, it would be a different domain. We, so we could still both load the old LTTNG modules in parallel with this fast kernel uh, system call tracer. Uh, so, so because it would not be a complete replacement, so that opens up a lot more room for uh, improvement, gathering feedback, implementing that feedback. We would not be constrained on, oh, we, we need backward compatibility. We don't. I mean, that would be new things, and then we can implement the, uh, uh, and act upon the feedback. So I'm going to start a poll. And oh, by the way, disclaimer, I, um, although the results of what everyone else sees is anonymous, they're not anonymous to me. I see who voted for what. So that's a disclaimer there. So I'm being transparent in this. So I want to see the interest in this from finally using the poll for something good. Actually, if I may just do it. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, Judy. Judy. Uh, yeah, you were asking about other users. I'm pretty sure Arnaldo would appreciate this. He's trying to make the perf trace look like S trace. Do all the things to have all the arguments. So having having the wheels to actually make it properly because now he is using like eBPF programs to get the values of, of the things. So that would be definitely one of the users. So of how many we have sixty people. Not everyone's voting, I don't think, right? So we're at thirty. I'm wondering how many people have left their or left their keyboard or something. I should put that down. Not at keyboard. Uh I'll give it a few more seconds. We have um three minute warning. Well wait, no. Yeah, three minute warning. Give it one more minute, see what people say. And um, so those that are interested, I guess Arnaldo's not here, so I would get push it again, CC 
you know, the perf folks, maybe BBF folks, um, and try to, not just to me and try to have something like, hey, this is what we have for use case. And yeah, having Arnaldo GD input is very, I'm going to stop the poll now and publish it. Where there we go. Of those that voted, 58% said, you know, yes, 8% said no, with 34% saying they don't care. Um, but that's good. That's a good reply back. Um, I had to check. Yeah, I was, Matthew, I was hoping you'd say like no or something. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I said yes, right? Why would yeah. I? <laughs> I know, I know. I would have made fun of you if you did. But okay, that's 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 good. So, um, anything else anyone wants to bring up? Nope. That's uh, that's pretty much the core of it. So we got two minutes, not enough to really make a break. Um, well, I guess we could start the next session. Uh, now it's one minute, so. Um, thank you, Matthew. Um, Thanks. Like I said, feel free to add more to the public notes. I kind of stopped when I'm talking. I can't write as much, so uh, feel free to add to the public notes. I will be recording the public notes, and hopefully, we'll be presenting everything. So the next one up is Event FS. So I'm hoping there's file system folks here. I asked them yesterday, please come here and heckle us. Uh, make sure everything's going well. And AJ, let me see, find you and make you presenter. You should be presenter now. Yeah, I just check. Oh, I have the access. Thanks. Yep. All yours. Oh, OK. So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the talk. Uh, myself, Ajay, works with VMware Photon OS team along with Steve. Uh, from last few months, working to reduce the memory footprint of Linux Tracer and come up with on-demand event FS. So here, uh, quickly we will go through the introduction of the Linux Tracer events followed by problem statement that is Linux Tracer memory footprint. Then we will have a look over the solutions which we are trying to do that is on-demand event FS. After this, quickly go through some code snippet of on-demand event FS, and we will conclude with some calculations, and then we will go over the slides, uh, uh, I mean, that uh, the task which we uh, I'm going to work, and then we will move to the sessions and feedback part. Okay, uh, Linux is designed by Steve to help out developers and designers to find out what is going on inside the kernel. It's used for debugging, analyzing latencies and performance issues. Within Tracer, we have events called as event tracing infrastructure, and it contains a lot of subsystem in form of directories, as we can see over these slides. Uh, this event infrastructure, uh, which is a subset of the Linux Tracer, and uh, this is a target of my talk. So here we will be uh, trying to reduce the uh, memory footprint of events of this directory. So eventually we will be reducing the size of the tracer. So here on this slide, uh, we can see a penguin which is representing the line X. When we boot the system, if the tracer configs are enabled, we have the default instance of the tracer. Uh, this magnifying glass is representing the Linux tracer, which is helping developers to look inside the running kernel. And uh, for some complex issues, we may require another instance of the tracers. Thanks to Steve, uh, we can have, and so on. We can have multiple instances of the tracers. And this, uh, I mean, this multiple instances of the tracer is trying to trace the same line uh, running, uh, same Linux running kernel. So here uh, we can, uh, I mean, if we want to create a instance of the tracer, we need to use MKDIR till the path of the tracing and then instances, and then we can give any name. I have given like LPC underscore one, LPC underscore two and so on. And these MKDIR command will create an instance of the Linux tracer. So we can see here with the LS command. 
so uh, within each instance we are having a event so each linux tracer instance is having a independent events so here we can see this uh, lpc1 is having a events which is independent so this event is called as a uh, events tracing infrastructure So let's move to the problem statement. As we have seen, uh, event tracing infrastructure has a lot of files and directories depending upon the kernel config. In my system, I have more than 11K of files and directories. So to create a event tracing infrastructure on my system, it consumes uh, approximate to 9 MB. Uh, we have uh, some more calculation in the conclusion slides. Uh, uh, let's see the component of the Linux tracer, uh, which consumes the memory. So here we have a uh, event tracing infrastructure, which is consuming 9 MB of memory uh, for, uh, I mean, on my system, which is having 11,742 files. Uh, Linux tracer also uh, has other components uh, like ring buffer, not included here as this is not that uh, I mean, in my talk, uh, I'm not considering the ring buffer. So ring buffer actually used to store the logs and the size depends upon the number of the CPU within the system. If we have less number of CPUs, then ring buffer will be smaller. And some part of the memory consumed by the internal structures of the Linux tracer that also not included here. So this single instance of the Linux, tra uh, Linux tracer, and this is of 9 MB. Uh, I mean, within this single instance, we are having event infra infrastructure, which is consuming 9 MB of the memory. And for some complex uh, uh, debugging or some other things, we need we need to have a multiple instances of the tracers. So each instance is consuming, uh, each Linux tracer instance is having a event tracing infrastructure, which is consuming 9 MB of memory. And as we are having multiple instances, we are ending up by consuming a lot of memory. So my goal here is to uh, reduce the memory footprint of the event tracing infrastructure. So ultimately we will be reducing the memory footprint of the Linux tracer. And target uh, which we have set, like we will be reducing 75% the memory footprint of the events. So, okay, uh, let's move to the approach we tried. So that is the on demand event FS. Okay, so uh, on demand events, uh, uh, on demand event FS means create the files and directory on demand and delete them immediately when no more requires. To create a file structure requires the object of find node and the entry. So instead of this, let's save only the metadata of the file and directory which consumes less memory to inode and de-entry. And later on, use this metadata to create the file or directory on demand. Let's see uh, how this on-demand event FS will work. Okay, here uh, I have taken a small uh, structure of files and folders, small hierarchy of files and folders. So let's assume A is a part of event FS. So we can say A is a subsystem of event FS. So within A, we have another Fold, uh, another folder as B, files one, two, and so on. So if we want to have this as a uh, as a trace FS, so uh, already implemented things. So for one uh, folder, we would require the object of inode and de-entry, which is near about, I mean, which is 776 bytes. So I have eight instance, so it will take around 6K of uh, 6K uh, memory. So on other hand, uh, here instead of having the, uh, I mean, instead of having the objects of inode or de-entry, we are having only a uh, metadata. I mean, we are having a structure which will have a metadata. So here we were having 776, but to store only the metadata, we would require only 128 of byte. And in total uh, for eight elements, we would require only 1K for the on-demand event FS. So uh, by doing these calculations, uh, so on-demand event FS consumes less 
uh, 80% less memory as compared to the trace FS. So now the question is coming, uh, if we are only having the metadata, but we have not uh, had the uh, uh, inodes and D entries and user will try to access the any file system within this event. So how, uh, how uh, I mean, what the user will get at that time. So let us assume uh, user is trying to navigate to the C. So CD, uh, A, B, and then C. So what will happen at the time, the call flow will come to the event FS. It will use the stored metadata, create the folder A, then it will create the folder B, and then it will create the folder C. So now you, you are inside the C folder. Now let's user want to see what's there in the C or want to see what's the permission of the C. So when it will execute LSC at this point, so at this point, again, uh, the event FS will use the metadata from three and create the file three. So now once uh, get the output user, <coughs> I mean, uh, once get the output of the file three, so immediately after that three will be gone. And once the user out of all the directories, so all the directories, uh, I mean, I nodes for I nodes and D entry for all the directories will be deleted. Uh, let's quickly have some uh, look of some snippets. So here uh, we have used eventfs file and eventfs inode to store the metadata. And uh, these are the uh, few APIs or functions. So here uh, we have eventfs add directory. So whenever we want to add a directory, whenever we will create a instance of the trace fs, so at that time this function will be called uh, from the tracer. And instead of immediately getting the object of the inode and the entry, we will be saving the <coughs> uh, metadata within this structure. And after saving the metadata, we will append this to the linked list of the parent. So uh, Linux has a mechanism. Uh, so if we trying to access some file or folder, which doesn't have any inode, I mean, basically, which doesn't exist in the form of inode or the entry. So at that time, uh, Linux will call the lookup function. So here we have we have already registered the event fs root fs uh, uh, root lookup function. So this will be called, and within this function, <coughs> so uh, whatever the list linked list we had, we will go through the linked list and retrieve the metadata of the file or folder and call the event fs create file. I'm just assuming real quick, if you go back to one thing that we're leaving out the error detection here, because obviously yes. the creative S could fail. So we're not showing error detection in case anyone's wondering. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, just so that it will fit in the slide, I have removed the extra uh, even, uh, I mean, return path. Um, I have a question. What um, happens if you user uh, run a, um, Ares uh, command on the, uh, say, the, the event directory. Uh, which command, sorry, uh, come again, please. Ls. Yeah, okay. Okay, so here, uh, if you uh, user will execute the ls, so at that time, <coughs> Uh, execution, I mean, uh, first of all, it will go to the Linux FS. So Linux FS will see that file or directory is not present. So it will call the lookup function. So in this case, uh, event FS lookup function will be called. So at that time, I don't have uh, the information which metadata I need to use, but I have the uh, my parent and the child. Parent is the directory where I'm looking for and child may be the directory or folder inside that parent. So by using the link list, which I have created at the time of creating that tracer, so that link list will be used and retrieve the information, I mean, retrieve the metadata of file or folder. And at that time, I will create the, uh, I will take the object of inode and D entries and create the, uh, I mean, uh, this folder, uh, sorry. This will be created. Uh, only uh, the root, uh, for example, the, uh, if we are uh, ls on the uh, root file, uh, root directory, uh, only mm -hmm. root directory will be uh, uh, what's it made. Yes, uh, let's assume uh, it's a events and then a. So only events is already, event is a static. So this a will be created dynamically on the fly. Only a, 
uh, if you are trying to do ls a then definitely uh, we assume that we should have uh, all the uh, i mean uh, at the output we should have all the files and folders so at that time parent is a so first it will create the a and then it will create all the files and folders within the a okay but uh, uh when it will be uh, removed but uh, uh because that's uh, the ls command will just uh, open up the the, the, the We'll say the root directory and read it, read there and close. Then uh, uh, when uh, uh, the ls command close it, uh, then uh, uh, the uh, the directory will be uh, uh, removed. Uh, if you are actually, I'm wondering. Wait, if we just do a ls, I guess the question is on chat. We don't actually create the inodes for the files in it. We just actually just create. Well. Do we just create the listing, or do we actually, when on the ls of the directory, do we actually create all the files with the denodes or the entries for content of that directory? I forgot. I can't remember the code. It's been a mm -hmm. while. Yep. No, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we will create uh, whenever required, and uh, before exit the system call, we will delete. But there are some cases in which we need to keep. If you are inside the B directory and do the ls, so till B we need to keep. Mm. And uh, this will be kept uh, not forever. So whenever uh, there is a call from the user or maybe a call for the drop cache, at that time that will be deleted. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I was here at the lookup. So in the okay. create, yeah. I'm just going to just mention in the notes, uh, Ted. So mentioned that if at the time we may not need to create the actual the entries for the files, but if we create inode numbers, we have to make sure that they're they are consistent or they're persistent. I guess. Uh, so if someone does the ls of a directory or they do a read dir, they may access. I guess we need to keep the inode numbers around in case i guess uh, is that ted is that what you're basically yeah, saying so basically the question is uh i w it wasn't clear how lazy uh lee you're creating the dentries and the inode and it's possible to be super super lazy in terms of you know at the time when you do the reader you need to return the file names and the inode numbers but you don't actually need to create any of the dentries or the inodes for the files in that directory, you only have to create the dentries uh, at the time when you actually stat or open uh, one of the files in the directories. Um, so I'm not, it wasn't entirely clear to me how much you're deferring the creation, but it might be possible to make it even more efficient. Because okay. Ajay's done a great, he's done most of the work on this. I mean, this is kind of like something I helped him with and I, ha I had a proof of concept, but we're not file systems experts. We just kind of just stared at file system code and said, hey, I think this is how it works. So we might be doing things completely wrong here. It's just from, and it's any, I have one question. I, I'm sorry to jump in here, but um, is there any other subsystem that does on the fly of like or pseudo directories that do on the fly creation of the D entries as it's accessed and then cleaned up afterwards based off of metadata? So I can't think of one. I think mainly because most of the pseudo uh, directories aren't that big. Um, I will note that people have complained about how much memory overhead Sisyphus uses because Sisyphus, you know, every single time you create new Sisyphus objects, it does instantiate everything. Um, and that is a pretty big memory overhead. Uh, so this is actually really, really cool. Um, and it's not a question of doing something wrong. It's just, it might be possible to be able to do it slightly better, right? So, you know, wrong isn't actually the right word here. It's just like, essentially what you're doing is lazy creation of data structures. So you're not consuming the memory until you actually need the data structure. Um, and it's possible to, uh, it's possible that you could be even more lazy in terms of when you create objects uh, and, you know, it's a great idea. I'm not sure we need to actually settle this, you know, on the call. Uh, you know, I think this is one of the things that might be better done, um, you know, as as a patch review in terms of 
this isn't wrong, but you could make it even better, right? Right. Um. So, so that's actually a good idea. I mean, microconference topics are basically to share ideas, have discussions, over uh, high level discussions, and then the rest of the work is done on the mailing list. And since you brought up SysFS, and the reason why this was done is actually the BPF folks actually complained that, you know, every time they make an instance, you get this huge memory footprint. And I'm looking at like, oh my God, you know, we have like 11,000 files that we're creating at every single instance that's basically showing the exact same, it's the exact same data at every single one of those. I'm like, there's gotta be a better way to, you know, why do we have to create all these directories if they're all sharing the exact same tree? And so, but the thing is you brought up SysFS and Compl complaints about that. Maybe we should make this a more in a generic way of saying for pseudo file systems, having a way that pseudo file systems, you know, if it's based off of metadata, why do we need to create the de-entries that have them always around? I mean, there is a problem with the fact that they might fail, but perhaps maybe this would be more efficient to do for most pseudo file systems to say, hey, you only, here's the data structures that just need to maintain state of that, those files, and then be able to create the de-entries just dynamically on the fly. Maybe we could make this more in is that a thought? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about how uh, block-based file systems work, right? Uh, when you uh, do a directory listing, we're not actually creating all the inodes for uh, all of the directories, uh, all the files in the directory, unless you actually stack the file. In which case, we have to create the i. We have to read the inode. Um, so that so stat can return the accurate information, right? And in this case, this is basically the same thing. Um, if you don't actually stat the file, you don't need to create the dentry or the inode. Um, but if someone does, you know, do an ls-l, then obviously you're going to have to create all the objects uh, when they they stat the file, right? So um, this is definitely a cool thing, right? All you know, all on-disk file systems do not create all of the inodes at mount time for obvious memory reasons. And uh, this is, yeah, this is a really, this is a really great thing to do. And it's probably applicable, not just to event, eventfs, but also uh, proc and sysfs. It's just, you know, the question is it hadn't been worth it for people to do it um, uh, until now. Uh, I mean, personally, I have big machines, and I find uh, tracing useful enough that nine megabytes is cheap at the price. Uh, but I can imagine other people want to save as much memory as possible. <laughs> yeah, especially since a lot of this uh, uh, ftrace is very popular among embedded boards because of the uh, TraceFS file says we don't need anything, don't need any user space tools. So by making the actual footprint of TraceFS much smaller, that's advantage for the embedded folks. But sorry, I didn't mean to hijack. Come on. No problem. Uh, so uh, probably uh, I think we should start a offline mail chain uh, so that we can have more uh, in detail. Uh, OK, uh, let me just quickly cover this part. So here uh, we retrieve the information of D node and I node. And using these functions, uh, we will link the I node and D node. Okay, uh, let's move to the conclusion. <clears throat> so here, uh, I will try to move to the conclusion part. So conclusion, we will compare the already existing TraceFS with the on-demand EventFS. So these are the theoretical values. Uh, if we will calculate uh, inode and de-entry, so it comes to 776 for single uh, directory or file. So instead of these, we are having eventfs inode and eventfs file and name. So it comes to 128 byte. So in total in my system, like I was having 11K of files and directory. So theoretical files and directories in the events, it comes to 9 MB. And on the other side, <coughs> it should, uh, I mean, it will come to approximately 1.5 MB. So in graphical representation, so currently if we'll see this blue line and uh, blue line is representing the trace FS. On other hand, the green line is representing the on-demand event FS. So we will definitely be And in practical, when I have done the POC and try to get the figures, so this one is matching exactly with the 9 MB. And in my practical, uh, I got with the on-demand, it's to 6 MB. Maybe I have done mistakes or something. I am looking further to uh, match these figures. Uh, 
so now further i mean i'm not uh, stopping here so now further i am trying to improve here if we'll see this is slightly going up means uh, for one instance is taking 1.5 mb 3 mb and 4.5 mb but i want it should be very linear so for that what i need to do i need to keep one uh, metadata uh, i mean shared metadata so that will be shared among the all instances so my ongoing task uh, analyzing why my practical value are not matching that's on me i am working and on another part i am trying to enhance the on demand event fs so that we will have a single copy of the metadata for multiple instances of the tracer so suggestions uh, i am looking whether i am on the right track or wrong things uh, or any better approach we have uh, to do this thing and apart, i mean this is the part of the event fs and other part i am looking like it's there any other improvement way to improve the complete uh, memory footprint of the linux tracer well, i think this is actually a um, great discussion uh take a lot of information of what we want to do um has is out there everyone knows what things are and i think this can easily be moved to um the I was late on the, the what's it called, the three minute. Mm -hmm. But the uh, I think this can be moved to the file uh, uh, list. Wait, Ted, is there a, a, a file system mailing list or is it just LKML? I probably should look the maintainer's file too, just to find BFS. You're right in the chat or whatever. Uh, but yeah, we'll probably, I think, uh, how do you, um, Ajay, how do you feel with your patch set, uh, I guess there's an FS Devel. Thank you, Linux FS Devel. We'll find, we'll re, we'll send to it. So, um, you, I think even the proof of concept that we have currently, maybe let's send that to the uh, file system now, our file system mailing list. I could send you that offline. I could give you all that information. And I think this would be good to, um, can move this to that discussion. I think everyone understands it. It looks like people have uh, a positive feedback on this. So it's what we're doing seems like not controversial. So that's, that was some part of my worry. So thanks a lot, Ajay. Um, yep. That was really good. Talk. Thanks. And thanks, everyone. So um, yeah. yep. does anyone else have any last thing? Because I think we're set for a break right now. Uh, Yes, I believe we have a break for 15 minutes and I'll let you guys uh, go. Thanks everyone for participating and feel free again to update the notes. I kind of stopped like so when I'm talking, I don't really do notes. Looks like there's good discussion going on in the chat. Let's find a way to save that. It's supposed to be a way to save the chat. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour. I got about half the people back. That's good. And I believe I'm next. No faults. No one's being a wise guy. Okay, so now to the final hour. So I guess I'll start. Um, so this session, uh, actually, could someone please, let's see, hold on a second, let me try this. So hopefully someone could take notes, or I could take notes later. I'll remember whatever things everyone said. Interesting, I'm not kidding. Okay, so I'm, hopefully people are back, so. I would discuss uh, function tracing with arguments. So today, if you do function tracing, you get, um, like if I run trace command and start the tra function tracer and show, we see the function and its parent. Very useful information, but sometimes we'd like to have more information than just that a function was hit. 
Uh, as I said, uh, you see the function as parent. I realized that I can barely see those arrows, but well, what about the arguments? As it would be nice to have to see the arguments. The question is, how hard will that be? We'd have to extract them at the time of when the functions hit. So we would need the reg registers as well as uh, stack information. And we need a quick way that we could find out how to map the registers and the stack information with a, the function that's being traced. Obviously, we'd need a quick uh, lookup table. Not only do you need to find a way to map it, but we also have to find a way that it would be stored into the ring buffer because every function is going to have a different format and a way that we could quickly store it into the ring buffer and be able to extract it and be able to see that information at a later time. Yep, and read it from the ring buffer. So the way uh, the function tracer works is when you enable function tracing, we have this call or we switch uh, the no op that starts at every single function in the kernel, well, almost every single function in the kernel, will switch it to a call to a ftrace caller, which is a trampoline that saves the arguments because to call the callback that's here, we have to save the, the arguments, otherwise this callback is going to clobber them. So first thing it does is to save the registers that store the arguments. And then we store the instruction pointer, the parent instruction pointer, the ftrace ops that registered. Um, and right here, uh, zero, I'll explain this, is the fourth argument in RCX register, and then we call the callback. And the callback function that you register to ftrace looks like this. Um, for those that have registered functions, you probably, this looks familiar. You have the instruction pointer of the function being traced, the instruction pointer of the parent that called it or the location where it's called back. Actually, it's the return address of the function. The ops that you registered to and the uh, PT regs, which is null unless you set a flag when you register the callback that says, I want registers. So if you set that flag, you, instead of calling the ftrace caller, this is an x86, uh, other architectures are similar. They, we call the ftrace regs caller, which again, just saves the registers, but this time it actually saves all regs. Last time it saves the arguments. This will save all registers, fill in the same information that we want, and then it will store the stack pointer in here and then call the callback. And that registers is basic, basically a PT regs, just like it would happen in an interrupt. So your regs callback could be like this. And if you use the same callback to for not only register, or if you didn't set the reg, want to save register flag, but say if it was used somehow where you didn't set that flag, you when it gets called, it would be regs equals null. So you could actually differentiate how, or you could either return or do something different. So you could have the same callback registered to a, Ftrace ops that says I want the registers and Ftrace ops that doesn't want registers, and you could differentiate that by the regs uh, being null. So, what I realized was that since we have to save regs anyway, or save the arguments anyway, because we don't want the callback to clobber them, why can't we pass that information to the callback? So, right there, we could save the regs. Instead, why can't we pass the this information to the callback? Well, the regs callback hook, remember, we have regs here, and that makes this will fail to be null if we did that for both of them. So we don't want to do that. So instead of doing PT regs, we're going to change it to something called ftrace regs. And since this is kernel API or ABI, we don't have to worry about you know changing. We could change it from kernel release to kernel release. Just gotta make sure that all the callers are fixed when you do this. And this is what I did. I I've updated this is work that's already been done. Instead of doing PT regs, I create ftrace regs. And there's information here that when you call regs, you can actually there's a helper function that says ftrace get regs that checks this information that 
will return null if the callback was an ftrace caller and it will actually return the full registers. And this is because Peter Zolstra and Thomas Gleichster were very adamant that says don't uh, don't return a PT regs that's partially filled because that could cause problems. So I created a different structure called ftrace regs and gave a helper function that just switches over. And if you look at the thing, it's basically identical. It's just that it uses, I think, one of the fields within the registers to say that, hey, this is filled or not. So we have the registers now for all the arguments that we need. Now we need a way to map the arguments for or map these registers to the arguments. And one that we've been discussing about is BTF has the, this information, how to map all the registers for every function to their arguments and if it's stack purpose. But the question is, can we do this quickly? What's the way to use this? I haven't really looked at the BTF code. I just know it exists. So I this is all uh, in theory right now. I haven't actually started implementing this, but this is something I highly want to work on. So the um, one thing is the ftrace ops, I didn't actually mean this. I probably think I should have said ftrace ops. I should have said the ftrace dynamic red. So basically, there's a table inside the kernel that maps all the locations inside the kernel that can be enabled and disabled for ftrace. So it's a very, right now, the field is only um, the structure, I think it's 16 bytes, but we could add information there that would point to the BTF information for every single function, and it's already there. But that means we just have to, every single function will now have a pointer to its information, which could add overhead to the uh, to the kernel. But again, do we care? Or we could have a hash table that we could load by a module, like I, I mentioned in other talks or topics that if we have this information in a module, we could just load it and then have it mapped directly to the BTF table. But we still need the BTF processing to say, okay, we got the BTF and we still need to quickly convert the information into a way to save it. So I just wrote this up as, <clears throat> excuse me, this isn't actual real code. It's sort of just a brainstorming of an idea of what I could imagine is that the callback, we would get a temporary buffer to store something in. That's usually, it's lock list to get this temporary buffer. It'll be per CPU, per uh, context for interrupt, normal, soft interrupt, NMI. So we get a unique buffer that we have access to that don't have to worry about other people writing to. We find this BTF information, and then we pass information, passing the buffer, the BTF, and the ftrace regs that it will write in some format the information we want into the buffer. We don't need to process it. We don't need to convert things to strings or anything. We just have to record the data that we want into that and then take this information and write it into the ring buffer. So I think it was temp buffer, what would it have? I mean, I think we could have this, this temp buffer that we allocate would be, we'd have a name or we probably have a bunch of, um, uh, array, it'd be an array of basically the name of the argument that we can record, the type of argument that it is, uh, whether it's array or not, and then have a data. So basically, just store the raw data as much as possible. We have something that TracePrintK uses, which is like a binary printf, which stores the format string and then just all the data in behind it. So it doesn't actually process the format string. So on uh, when we read the ring buffer, either in user space or at the time of reading, we do all the processing there. So all I want is a, basically a way of saying, this is the, these are the arguments and the type of field that the argument is and the, a data blob. And then on the reading aspect, actually do things a little bit um, more. And actually, that's my last slide for now. Masami, sure, this is, this is my uh, proposal. Okay, yeah, yeah. Actually, that, uh, that is what I'm... <laughs> I'm currently doing on the okay. K probes. Yeah, uh, these are uh, these two hours. I'm I'm trying to understand the third the B BTF and uh, how to use it in the uh, K probes. So uh, it seems that I it could 
be okay, but uh, uh, BTF, it seems, doesn't have any uh, register assignment or something like that, so that uh, we need to get the, uh, the information from the, uh, the PTX or FLEX uh, from, uh, yeah, yeah uh, say, uh, according to the coding convention. Yeah. Yeah, this slide right here is my um, my magical my po this is my pony function. You know, my yeah. I want my ponies. So and, uh, actually, uh, we already uh, sorry. Uh, I actually uh, we already have our, uh, the coding convention uh, argument uh, getting function for some uh, architecture, uh, including x86. So you can use that to get the, the information, but uh, uh, you need to uh, process that, uh, uh, for example, uh, yeah, uh, reducing that the size of the, the register, uh, because that the, it's, this one uh, has a, uh, let's say, uh, the um, signed um, int or signed uh, short, you need to uh, register, uh, sorry, uh, record that uh, just uh, uh, to, uh, two bytes or something like that on the, the buffer. So that uh, for that purpose, uh, BTF will be used, uh, uh, can be used. And also BTF has a, uh, uh, say, a function uh, prototype. It seems to have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, each uh, uh, argument name so that uh, you can also uh, save the name. Okay, yeah. so actually, you know, I'm wondering sometimes, here's another idea that I thought, since this has to be done quickly at time of recording, if we just know, if we just tell at the time of recording, what registers need to be saved and not worry about format or anything, just say these registers need to be saved for this function and, yeah. and the stack, or if it has more than six, this much of the stack. So we just need to say what needs to be saved. And then on the reading side, we could say, okay, this function, here's the function, here's the data, let's convert it now and have a way oh. to print it. Oh, I see. So that's a, you mean that our, uh, uh, let's say save that our, uh, the registers, uh, for example, and our, uh, the format afterwards. Yes. Um. But then we need a way to form, we need a special function to format everything. And if we could copy this to user space, user space is going to need it somehow to have that exact same information. Yeah, I think it's also work, uh, at least for the F trace, uh, because I, I mean that there, there, uh, for the event, uh, I need to, uh, let's say, um, save the format data. Uh, let's say, uh, compose the format data for the each event, a dynamic event. But uh, uh, for the uh, F phrase, I think you can, um, let's say, uh, make, uh, arrange it. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, that... yeah for F trace, we, this would be a special event, a special event ID. And I mean, I think it would look identical, or, or be almost identical to the normal function trace, which is a special, uh, has an event ID, which will like will record the you know the instruction pointer, and um, the parent pointer, and then it will record. Like I said then we can add just a blob of data to it. That's all the regin, um, uh, the stack, and then because based on the ID, we could then call our on reading of it because we how a event is read is based off of the ID. So. Once you read the ID, it's going to jump to some function that says, I know how to process this event ID. And that specific event ID could be, say, oh, this is a function with arguments. And then it will go through and check the table using the IP to find the function. And then, so this could be done at the end processing. Now, a question is, let's say if you have a module, you do the recording and then you unload the module and that those, the functions and you don't have that information anymore. Maybe this is only created per module. So the IPs change. Uh, do we want do we want to store just enough information and process it later, but then we have to worry about module unloading where you lose that data, or maybe we have I know LTTNG has kind of a um, um, metadata re being recorded, so it could let that be known. But I'm just wondering what people's ideas are on this. Oh, so right. Stephen, I had to do a little bit of this um, for I created a user space kind of version of this that co collaborated with the BPF program in the kernel. So. The recording process there, all you need to worry about is, do I know the size 
of each of the arguments and then I, I you record those arguments so you get that from btf initially but you, you know the way it works with the program is you push it from user space into the kernel so once you have the size of each argument and what you need to record you just do that and then you worry about btf on the user space side now for the reason for that is module btf is a little bit complicated so btf has this idea of split btf where there's the core kernel btf and then there's module there's a split that sits on top of that which basically the module specific stuff and the idea of, of that is you don't want to duplicate all the kernel data structures in each module's description so the problem with that is that the same different data structures could have the same id depending on which module you're dealing with so you kind of want to get away from that you know btf ids probably in the actual processing here if you can find a way to populate your hash with okay this is this is this argument is a pointer um so i need to record you know whatever uh, 64 bytes from that address or if it's just an integer i just need to, to record the argument if you can populate your you know your callback with or your hash with that information and then let the whatever program takes that information later on and actually renders the, the data um if that knows about btf and it knows the instruction pointer it can do that lookup um right it's uh, well we also remember that some of the stuff is done inside the kernel so i mean on yeah. the reading side if you do a recording you do a cat trace or a cat of the trace file that's in the trace fs directory the trace file actually does the processing uh, on all these things but that's done but it's it performance is not an issue here because you're just reading it if it's slow it's slow uh, it's the recording that's very important so we need at least a way of saying what to record and it's not just size and size of L, uh, items so you have to say Basically, what we need to know is registers and uh, stack usage. Because, yeah. um, for example, if you're on a 32-bit machine and one of the parameters is a 64-bit machine, it's going to store that 64-bit in two registers, probably, or on the stack. Uh, and I don't. We usually look down on this, but I don't think there's any place in the kernel that passes a structure via stack, except that's you know these structures are usually just one or you know has one item in it that so it's not really a structure but if someone were to pass a large item or an array onto as a pass by you know, value a copy then how its format is uh, up architecture specific compiler specific so we need that information on how to or we just punt and say we don't know how to parse this um yeah up, re, up i think that at this moment we doesn't have uh, what's a BTF doesn't have that so uh, I think that uh, you uh, you for your uh, method uh, what's it, or, uh, suggestion or how I say <laughs> uh, yeah what you need is uh, the number of the uh, argument at this moment so that are uh, because that are, we have our uh, some uh, register foreign convention so that are uh, how many uh, argument uh, if we if the the function get uh, if you know that uh, you can uh, save that uh, registers, you know. Um, right. Well, like I said number of arguments is not. You need a number and size. As I said, there's some the size of the argument can cause you to use more registers than just the number of arguments. No, no, it's uh, you know uh, the up, up to the recording time. You need you just need uh, the number of the uh, arguments because that's uh, the the function uh, argument, uh, what's it, the register assignment is uh, fixed. No, uh, no, but no, but I'm saying, like I said, if you are on 32-bit um, x86 and you pass in a 64-bit number, that's, that's so you say you have one, you can't just say number of arguments, because they like can say yeah, I have yeah, one argument, course. but you need two registers to save. Uh, yeah, right. That's why it can't just be number of arguments. It has to be a number of arguments plus the size. Yes. Sven? Yeah, one thing that I also figured out is if you have different function types, like for example, floating point, which is not often used in the kernel, but for example, on S390, if you have a first argument with a um, floating point, then it will be a different register than your normal integer register. So you need to type information also when storing. I mean, right now we don't care about floating, in tracing, but it's just one thing that that I, I noticed when reading the ABI, that if you want to do it correctly, you also have, about, have to think about such things. Well, honestly, okay, so S390 is magical. So I'm not going to really, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sort of like, yeah, you know, 
you could do all, uh, from what I understand of S390 is like, you know, you could do all this in x86 and S390, oh yeah, that's one command. So um, floating point in the kernel is frowned upon because they're usually, especially since, you know, Linux was basically developed from, you know, the i386 and floating point was a whole set of number of registers and to save and restore those registers um, takes a lot of work. And that way the kernel should never use floating point because there's it's a lazy method so it can mess up with the it, there's, it takes a lot of work to do anything with floating point within the kernel so honestly i think we could just say we're not going to handle floating point and not worry about or you know we just don't handle it yeah. uh, and that should be okay I, i'm not i've never had to deal with a floating point issue within the kernel but just uh, let people know i'm doing this to myself three minutes i think yeah I would say I think the best thing would be to get this register mapping information into VTF and then use this when writing into the ring buffer, fetching the arguments and then doing all the post processing in the reader side. Yeah, it would probably be best. I saw Peter kind of pop up there. Peter, you have anything to suggest? I literally just dropped in and I have no idea what you're all talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Using, uh, so quick summary, since I have like you know, in one minute summary is I want to get record uh, arguments into uh, function tracing. And the main thing we're talking about is what do we store in the ring buffer and how do we figure out for each, just to record just enough, not recording everything, just say, I want to record, if this function has three arguments, record these three arguments. Now we have to know how many registers those three arguments require because if you're on 32 bit, you know, record a, one of those arguments is 64 bit, it's going to require two registers. Or just have, so basically we need a mapping to say, what do we record? And I think we're all in agreement that we're just going to record the bare minimum, not even explain name or type, we'll just record a blob. And then based off of some sort of structure, probably BTF. And then on the post, on the reading side, that's when we'll give it a name and how to process this. So, uh, so, so Ted, do, do, are going Peter first? Yeah, do you care about stack arguments? Yes, that's why we have to know what to, so it's not just registers, but the, uh, I mentioned the F trace regs here, that also gives you a stack pointer. So this magic, this is my pony function that I'll ignore the temp buffer, but I'll pass in some sort of like BTF information, some information with the F, tra F regs and it'll give me, um, and I forgot, and this should also have the IP in there. So if I pass in the, the you know, what, what function is this? Some BTF information, and F regs, I'll be able to get all the information I need to store those arguments. Yeah. Yeah. And my question, uh, which I think I'd asked on the chat too, which is, is uh, structures that are pointed to by an argument in scope, because that gets super complicated. Like some of these structures are huge, and we might only want one or two fields out of the big structure. And I have no idea how you might specify that, oh, for a struct buffer head, you know, these are the three fields we want out of the struct buffer head. Um, so I know I'm asking for a really, really large pony, but I was wondering if that was something you were considering. For this, the answer is no. Um, yeah, this know. would not, this would just be, give you the pointer to the structure. Now we have K probes and event probes that could be built on top of this that could get that information for you by, by we actually have an API to say, give me this structure, this offset, and you can even follow the structure. So if a structure has a pointer, you can follow that pointer into another structure. And that structure has a pointer, you can follow that one. I actually have a talk where I went like five structures down. I think I used, I don't know, the um, uh, a network SK buff and got the device that it came in on. I think that would also be getting complicated with use of space addresses if you're just printing following every pointer. Yep. So I'll. Um, so Masami, I, since you said you're working on something similar like this, uh, if you have, oops, um, a if you have information about that, please share with me. I plan on I, this is something I want to work on. Um, there's a few things that left on my to-do list, and this is one of my my to-do lists that I had for a long time. And I think we now have finally enough information yeah, in the kernel to do this. So time is up. Thank you, everyone. Um, I didn't write any notes and no one else did, but I'll just go back and watch the video and write it up afterwards. Um, with that, up next is myself again on the last topic of today. 
Uh, let me switch slides. Okay, so uh, this is similar, but this is actually focused not on function tracing, but on um, function graph tracing and other systems that within the current subsystems in the kernel that record the return of a function. Basically, those are KREP probes. I put actually I put in the order of where they actually I think were um, added to um, the kernel. So KREP probes was first. Function graph tracing, and just recently we have BPF direct callers. So for KREP probes, and uh, this is the format that for if you want to create use um, the tracefs directory to create a uh, return pointer. So here I say, okay, I say R for rep probe, colon, I give it a name, It's uh, so try lock. I pass a function name. So for here, it's, you know, raw spin try lock. And I want the return value. And I do dollar sign rep val, which is a special value, a variable that you pass into K probes, K probe events in the FS directory, and it will give you the return value. I start it start the event and I show it and here's the try locks it gives you the information of where uh, the who called the the raw spin lock and gives you the return value one one here's a case where it didn't a return zero I guess didn't get the lock function graph tracer is uh, simple enough it's just you start the function graph tracer and it tells you if it if you see a uh, semicolon right here it actually merged two events together. It merged the start event and the end event. And it over, here it shows you the uh, the amount of time between the entry and exit. So it gives you uh, the duration of the functions. And what it's doing is re each of these little n squiggly brackets is the return side of the function. I don't have an example for a BPF um, direct trampolines. I'm sure it was talked about in the BPF track. I've seen a few. Uh, talking uh, examples, so, but it does it differently than what KREP probes and function graph tracing does. So we may not be able to consolidate the two or consolidate uh, KREP probes and function graph tracer, maybe. But the um, I'm going to discuss every methodology, and then we could see what we could do. Brainstorm ideas. So. Once someone gets the uh, an enviable task of doing kernel side uh, CET, it will be very useful to have them all in a single um, framework. Very good point. Um, it's funny because I forgot about that, and that is one of that was one of the rationales for doing this, and I just happen to forget about it. So for those, I believe that's isn't that like the shadow stack thing where it actually verifies the stack and since. Correct. Since, so if if, if you do the, the return trampoline, you have to rewrite the shadow stack. And that's <laughs> that's messy at best. Right. Yeah, so that's a win if we have our uh what's it or the uh, those are um uh power task uh shadow stack, I can uh easily use uh change the uh carrot probes on it. So I'll, I'll could, let me just finish up so, so, so people understand what we're talking. So for <clears throat> KREP probes and, K and function graph tracing, basically do things very, very simple or sim similar, not simple, <laughs> similar. They both hijack the return pointer and then saves it to a shadow stack. They do the shadow stacks differently. And I think that's what Masami was just coming about, talking about. <clears throat> we replace the return pointer with a return to some trampoline. And that trampoline is responsible for putting back and going back to the original uh, function that it hijacked. So here's a graphical version of how it works. You have a, say we're calling schedule, something, some function called schedule. And we jump here and, and the return address of the schedule call gets placed on the normal stack. And we jump to here and put scheduler, the schedule code has a call to ftrace caller. So it jumps in, as I showed in the previous topic, that you know goes and saves regs, and it 
passes the uh, on the normal stack is this uh, return code or return or the return address. So, so F trace caller knows where to get the trampoline knows how to get back. But let's say <clears throat> when we call the callback is going to update the uh, IP address. So instead of returning back to A, it returns back to C. And, and we create this shadow stack that we're going to save the original caller in. Now, when this guy returns, it's still the B was on there, so it returned back normally to who called the trampoline. But now this return is going to call C, what was on the stack. So the return trampoline is going to replace the old guy back with A. So when it returns, or does it, it could be a return, it could be a jump, or you know, the details, you know, that's just in the implementation details. So when it's done, it jumps back to where it calls. But that's how we trace in this rec callback, or either for the function trace, function graph tracer, or K rep probes, that's how it returns or traces the return side. BPF direct trampolines do things slightly different. They call the trace function from the trampoline itself, which will then just, it doesn't modify the stack. It just returns back to the tracer and then returns back to the parent function. So for a direct trampoline, which uses the F-trace infrastructures to replace it, but what F-trace will do is instead of putting the F-trace caller, it return it puts in the direct caller, which is why we call it direct trampolines because uh, it doesn't use the F-trace infrastructure. It just calls whatever you give it uh, directly. So the direct trampoline calls this guy, and I believe this is what BPF does. So BPF will now call, do its call, saves the arguments, but only saves the arguments that it really needs. So this actually is uh, optimized per function. So it saves only the arguments that are required, calls the callback function, returns the store args, and now it actually calls the it will actually call the scheduler uh, scheduler schedule schedule function from the trampoline. So now when the trampoline's done, it returns back to the callback here. You know, pop, uh, now we trace the end of it, pop it, pop all the information off, and then we return back to now. And this may, like I said, it may not 100% be correct this explanation, but that's basically the idea of how the PPF. Uh, direct trampolines work. So, what are how we want to merge these ideally together for various reasons? And function graph tracer really is the simplest of the three because it just says record the end. It just says give me who you recorded to and a timestamp. Boom. Very simple. You can't attach anything to it. It's uh, uh, it's pretty much set in what it will do. K probes is different because you can attach a callback to the return. So it requires a full set of regs because you don't know what that callback wants. So it's a lot more, has a lot more features. Uh, it has the requirements of anything. It needs to be able to handle anything. So it probably, uh, is that, am I incorrect, Masami, on this? Yeah, uh, correct. But uh, what you are, let's say, concerned, um, because that are, these are uh, different requirements, means that they're, uh, Trampoline uh, code, not the uh, what's say uh, the shadow stack. If we, uh, we can uh, use that the shadow stack, so that uh, we can, um, uh, you know, uh, call that there are the many trampolines uh, as you want right. under a uh, shadow stack. Okay, so basically, your idea here is to kind of take what like uh, the the two. Code spaces, ret, you know, the kernel repoline and the function graph tracer rip out the way it does the mapping and create a single interface, maybe somehow to say, I want, you know, just call this guy on the shadow stack. Now, the question also be can we call both of them? Can we register more than one? We need a way to say we can handle more than one yeah, callback. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that uh, because that are, uh, if if we have uh, the several uh, different uh, what's it, uh, the trampolines uh, uh, address on the shadow stack, we 
Yeah, uh, the return uh, will, uh, yeah, one trampoline return would return to the another trampoline. Right. Uh, so that it oh. will, uh, uh, what's it, uh, do that uh, until the uh, ori uh, return back to the original code. So basically, on the, it'll just put on the stack, return this guy, return this guy, and just swap it. Yeah. Sort yeah. of. It's kind of funny because that's how, um, when we wrote function graph tracer, I'm going to give a little story here. I, I just break a little time here. Um, someone asked me, so how does function graph tracer handle tail calls? And <laughs> this was like two years after function graph tracer was in the kernel and we were using it. And I, <laughs> I my first response was, it shouldn't be able to. <laughs> but it seems to work. And I found out that it worked just by chance. Um, what happens is when you, you know, when you enter it, it, it hi, when you enter the function, it hijacks the return address. So when you had a tail call function, when you hijack the return address, it replaced the return to the trampoline with another return to the trampoline. And so yeah, if you had a bunch of tails calls, and all every time we did the tail call, instead of jumping all the way back to the original, it jumped to the trampoline, and that trampoline replaced it with another trampoline. It just happened to be perfectly matched. So it was just coincidental that. Function graph tracer worked for tra uh, tail calls. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, but I think that's actually an analogous to how it would work if you had k rep probes and function graph tracer on the same function. You'd have one return trampoline would return to the other one, depending on which one was called first from the function graph tracer. And with Gideos's, um recent addition to uh, the code, where we actually have function graph tracer as one of the users of the function tracer and not a separate entity. I believe that because if with K rep probes registers with function graph tracer, function graph, oh, sorry, with the function tracer, function graph tracer registers with the function tracer, whoever gets called first is going to be, will replace the parent with the trample with its trampoline and whoever gets called yep. second will just replace that trampoline with its own trampoline so when it returns back it should just bounce back bounce back and i think everything should work yeah it should that... work yeah and uh, uh also uh shadows in a yeah with their oh that uh, yeah i i saw that there uh, the extra data so that i'm okay yeah <laughs> Okay, with the shadow stack, adding stack, so you can't, so one thing the shadow stack needs to do is also store data from the caller, so the caller could actually send data, so, um, so should I continue with the work, or, uh, Masami, did you have your own stuff that you were doing on top of that? Sorry? Or did you have your own version of the shadow sta uh, stack information, or did you look at my patches for the shadow stack? So, so K red probes used to have a different shadow object per yes. red probe yeah. thing, and, and, and I sent patches to rip that out. I lost track of where we are with them. Did we merge them, so, Sami? Yeah, uh, it's a different. Uh, what's it? Uh, the wrist. Uh, so that uh, it's a, actually not the shadow stack, but the uh, the shadow wrist stack wrist. So that the return uh, when our, uh, the trampoline get the uh, the code, it will uh, trace that the trace back the uh, the wrist, and find that the, the correct uh, the address or say match the address so that the um, and the code that call back that the uh, uh, how how I say um, the um, um, uh, call backs. With some um, some um, what's the extra data. So uh, it's it's uh, actually not uh, what's it our power task uh, shadow stack, but uh, uh, we have our uh, global shadow stack. Okay. Yeah. So do we want a global shadow stack in that case? So that's just one huge global shadow stack, or do we want? No, I I don't think that that is a good idea because that is not uh, scalable. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think what I'll do is I'll probably rip out the uh, shadow stack logic in uh, function graph tracer into its own entity. Yeah, but uh, uh, someone, uh, of course, that are uh, consider about the 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 size of their 
the uh, shadows that per, per task because that are if we have our task uh, let's say like a uh, one k uh, uh, for example uh, if we have our uh, one k uh, process uh, tasks uh, then uh, uh, we need to co uh, consume that uh, at least four uh, four megabyte uh, extra uh, right let's say, yeah. Uh, memory for their shadow stacks. Well, it does take up, like I said, it doubles the stack size of every event, uh, pretty yeah. much. I mean, well, it's stack size for x86, I believe now is 8K. Uh, but I think we only would need 4K, I would assume. And then, and also we need protections of how, and a way to say, no, you can't, you failed to register. So the whatever infrastructure say, we ran out of stack space. Uh, that yeah. needs to be a task there. stack is 16k, interrupt stack is 8k, and oh. exception stacks just run from 4 to 8k. So there we have it. So, but the thing is, oh, you think maybe we still just do the, you think 4k for just information for tra trampoline information? It's not actual, you know, or not, we should, well, we have, you could store data there, but you shouldn't be storing a lot of data. I don't know. And if you do, yeah. you, have limited amounts. I think 4K shadow stack per task, and it gets allocated. And if you don't allocate it, like I said, um, there's the way function graph tracer is. If it fail, if, if a task fails to get the stack, it just doesn't get traced. Uh, although I think we might have information to say it failed. I don't know. I should probably check that. Uh, but still, but I think that that's good. I think we could go on to that. Um, look into it uh, offline. But I think this is a good idea to start look like you know look it up. I'll write some code and uh, you can review it. My pro problem is um, how does BPF do this? And I don't know if we have, if we can do anything with BPF. Um, so I, here's the proposal I guess I had for the idea, um, I guess is to consolidate to two. The one is, oh yeah, let me go back slide here. The, uh, when we, uh, what's this called? We restore the new IP address. So one thing I did, I do, oh, that's just talking about adding extra data to the stack. That's one thing I think we already discussed. And, you know, you'd be able to get access to the extra data. So you can pass data from the entry of the function to the end of the function, but I think that's what you do. Um, let's see, so, they like said one thing is it customizes the arguments per function. As I said, it has an optimization. If BPF direct templates store the are only just the argument. So if there's three arguments, it stores three arguments. So if you have something that does multiple arguments, it's it's more difficult to do a generic version for this. Um, now, if there's anything on the stack, here's the issue that with the BPF trampolines, it must to be copied. Um, so you really can't have a generic doing it this way. What I mean by it is if you have functions with more than six arguments on x86, you know, from here, we save args. You, when this guy got called to this guy, so this SKB flow di dissect has nine arguments. And that means arguments seven, eight, and nine. Um, yeah, I see someone complaining about the background. I, I used the uh, temp. Uh, Linux plumber's template background, and unfortunately, I on my slide and PDFs, this looks fine, but now these look like lines attaching everything. So yes, I'm sorry about that. I didn't notice that until I pulled this up. But anyway, back to the story here. SKB flow dissect um, has nine arguments. So you have the first six arguments passed in registers, and argument seven, eight, nine is on the stack. Now we here we save args. We'd actually have to. To pro do this properly, we actually had to copy the arguments on here, back here, because we, um, from here, okay, so when this guy called the direct trampoline, its return address here is on the stack, and we can't, when we call, oh, I forgot, cut and paste error, this was supposed to be the uh, SKB flow dissect. So when SKB flow dissect gets called back here, to access the arguments, you can't have the B on there. So you have to have a way, you have to copy all the information to the stack as well. So that's an issue with uh, the BPF side of things. 
and it's a pop args. I just think I'm just following through, but that's all I have for uh, that much. And so you're guarding yourself now. I've been timing myself. Um, um, so, so, so why did the BPF guys do something radically different than the rest of us? Um, is this faster for them? Is this just what they came up with? This is faster. This is a, they optimized everything. And when it's funny because when Alexei did this, he I don't believe he envisioned doing this generically. It is basically specific per event and I kind of or per function. So they had certain functions they want to attach to. So each function got its own trampoline with unique information on it. So it wasn't okay. until later that people started saying, hey, let's do this for all functions using BPF. And this is where things failed. And actually I found a bug in the, in the kernel where it, something wasn't mapped where it could have called the function didn't save enough registers. Yeah, so, so this is very cool tricky and, and, and it relies on BPF knowing the actual stack or the, the argument layout and everything. It's, it's... It uses BTF for that. Yeah. So the thing is, if, if BPF needs to know the layout anyway, why does yeah. it need to do the copy? Because the only reason it's doing the copy is to match the regular calling convention, such that it can pass those arguments. And BPF, okay. if it knows it needs to skip the address, it could get at the stacked args. It's not bit, that. Right? It's 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 the okay. I have a this is a cut and paste. Pretend this says SKB stack flow. It calls the function it's tracing from the trampoline. The function it's tracing has to know where it is Sorry, or where these arguments are on. This I understand. Stack. Sorry. That's the problem. It's not from the callback it calls. The callback knows where it is. It's this guy. It's this calling because what ftrace and krep probes does. It just hijacks the uh, the return address and it just calls it as if the uh, it calls it as if it was uh, called directly. So the function gra fun or the schedule or the SKB flow di dissect. Uh, function doesn't know that it's called from a trampoline. It, well, if it checks its parent pointer, it'll say, oh, well, it'll see the return address or the return trampoline, but it won't. Sure. So they could actually solve this by generating two trampolines, one for the call and one for the return. And then the call trampoline could just alter the return address, call the regular function, sorry, jump to the regular function as normal. That In other works. words, it could implement it the same way where you implement it. Yeah. But no, BPF likes to implement things themselves. Okay, I appreciate that, but I'm saying this. So I, I think one I of the might be misunderstanding this, but BPF trampoline doesn't save arguments to pass it to the pro, like to the kernel function, right? Like to save it for kernel function, it saves arguments to pass it to BPF program that will be called at the end of the uh, kernel function call. Well, so only, by that time, like the input arguments might be modified, so we save. This is to, this so. is about okay. There's two trampolines BPF uses. One is for tracing the function. And yes, that's true. It does everything it does, calls the BPF thing, and then pops everything off and goes back to the function. Yes, that's not an issue. Okay. There's another BPF trampoline that records the end of the function. That's what this does. What does it mean, records the end of the function? It calls this return callback at the end. It calls the function itself, and then it traces the return of that function. Exactly, and that's what I'm talking about. It's actually the same trampoline. So yes. BPF so, can have like BPF programs that are called before the function that's being traced and after simultaneously. Okay, then how I'm talking about okay, this call back to the function. What does it do? You have uh, this address, you have your you have this guy's going to return back to D. That's on there. Do you modify the return when you return call back here? Do you not do you modify the uh, return stack? Or um, do you you, Sorry, I'm so, not following like all the diagrams. So like when okay. you say callback, is it like if in BPF case, that's BPF program, like the custom BPF program okay. that will be called, or you mean like the kernel function? Okay, so let me let me break this up real quick. In fact, time's up, but we have five minutes extra anyway. Right. So here you call the direct caller. This is not a BPF program. This is the trampoline that will call the BPF program. This is the unique right. thing that's created on the fly. So yeah. this is the direct caller that BPF creates. And this mm -hmm. callback here is the program. So it saves args. It just needs because the callback, depending, I mean, if, if the callback calls any helpers, it's going to clobber registers. So it needs to save the arguments of this guy. So this guy has to at least save, here it has to save the registers, at least. Calls the callback. Now, 
your program's called. Now it's got to restore the registers because it's about to call this guy again. Again, this is a this was a typo. This is supposed to be uh, SKB flow, but call this schedule mm -hmm. or whatever. So here's where the function gets called. It's actually plus five because it's not going to jump back to the function. It's going to jump back after the direct caller was done. Now this guy needs access to the uh, registers. Let me see if I have the place here. Yeah, because if you don't copy the registers, when it returns back to B, A is still here. Or is it? Uh, I think that's what it was because it still has this B caller that's on the stack, unless you popped it already and modified it. So maybe it is popped. When you do this, maybe you pop this register off and call it. So A is still here for when this guy calls. So maybe that does, well, yeah. yeah it's got to return kind of back to this guy. I don't know guy. if you can, you can figure this out here. And we probably should involve Alexei as well because he implemented most of that code. Yes. Uh, like from high level, I don't remember like all the specific details. From high level, we saved the arguments not because we need to save it, as far as I know, right? Like not because we need it for the kernel function. We save it because when the BPF program is called after the function returned, we want input arguments to be untouched so we can record right. them like after the fact, right? So right. that was my impression, but yes. I might be missing some like global. No, that is, I don't want the input arguments touched, but the, the problem is here is if you call from the register, when this return comes back, do you, you want to come back to the trampoline? And right. that's that informate that return address, which is D, actually I probably don't have it here. Yeah, it calls that D that's here, it's on the trampoline. If you don't have these arguments, you're going to have D, well, B is probably, yeah, the B could be replaced, but you're going to have D, A, and the registers where this A, the A, D is not expected. It should be A register. So it should be one returns. When you call the function you're tracing, it can only have the return address followed by the arguments. But in this case, you'll have two return addresses to get back to, one to get to back to the trampoline, one to get back to the parent. And that's going to shift everything off by uh, the address size. So the arguments won't match because it's on stack, it won't match when you call that function. So you want to corrupt. Uh, if you if you don't make a copy from the stack, you're going to corrupt the uh, information on the on the uh, the function's callback. And right now, I I know this isn't handled because you have a limit of on x86. You only record six functions or six. You only allowed it. it exactly. It's actually hard coded where you can only trace, or you go attach to uh, functions that have six arguments or less. And right. if you try to attach something to more, it will fail. And I guarantee you the reason why that's there is because of this problem. I see. Could, could be. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know like all the low level details. Just wanted to yeah. point out that like we, we want, at least in addition to all this, like we want input arguments untouched at the end after the function return. That That's like super important property. So We all want that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So anyway, time is up. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll have to go back and watch some of the stuff. But thank you also for those who are taking notes uh, for my talks. I just kind of take notes while I talked. And I think that wraps things up. There's a lot of good information. Thank you, everyone. Uh, make sure you fill out your survey surveys at the end. If you, you know, first 200 will get a T-shirt from VMware. And with that, is any final questions? Uh, I haven't been checking the chat. So I'll continue on the chat if people want to. But... And I will go start saving the information on the files. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much.